Can. I don't know if I can get it done in the next five minutes. Uh, So you can see I'm presenting here from inside of an emulator of software code, and it's clipping the edge off here, which is sort of unfortunate. I should test that beforehand. But uh, part of the hassle here is I'm running Linux on this Mac, and then I'm running Apple Win inside of the Wine emulator, and you know, it's so complicated. So. Uh, So yeah, so uh, about me, I'm from, I am a professor at the University of Maine in Orono, Maine. And uh, if you squint really hard, that's uh, Mount Katahdin in Maine, tallest mountain in Maine. That's where the Appalachian Trail ends. That's where I was about a week ago. It's a brand new national monument, Woods and Waters National Monument, that they built. There's not a single person in it, 10,000 deer flies. So it's probably why there's no people in it. But, uh, but at the University of Maine, I do various things. I do mostly things like high performance computing and hardware performance. But eventually, they, they looked them up, and now Probably actually bags to probably bugging and they donate money or something now. But uh, they finally realized they've been famous along the way now. I think we should build like a 6502 chip or something like that. It would be cool, but uh, not like that. But, so a slight connection there. So about me, I've been using Apple II since I was fairly young. So again, if you squint a bit, uh, it's me sitting. In, well, you actually can't see me because I'm clipped off there. But there's the Apple II, and that's me. Um, so uh, yeah, my. Uh, 
But growing up in my neighborhood, we weren't like, in a very fancy neighborhood necessarily, but everyone in my neighborhood had Apple IIs for some reason. I didn't actually meet someone who actually ran a Commodore 64 until I was in high school. So. And my dad taught high school, uh, computers at a high, the local high school. And you know, when he first started, it was doing punch cards and taking them in once a week to the IBM mainframe, you know, getting your print out, and then having a week to debug before you do it again. But by the time I came around, they actually had a small lab of Apple IIs. I actually got to use the punch card machine a few times. But, uh, and sometimes he would uh, bring one home in the summer to do work on it and such, and he let me use it. And so I'd get books out of the library, and I'd take things in out of 3 one Contact magazine and all that. And uh, so because of that, I spent a lot of time, uh, a lot of time putting in basic programs and all that. And I actually saved them all, and I imaged them at one point. So I have all these disks full of these old basic programs. You can see this nice little... My dad made that program for me that had the little thing. And so I just have, you know, five to ten disk images and just full of all these tiny basic programs with stupid names and full of just random things. And, you know, I never comment my code, so I know where they're all from. So it's sort of fun. So if you wish you had all your old basic programs from your kid, I'd say, you know, it's actually not as exciting <laughs> as it sounds. So. So yeah, my family eventually did get a machine at 2E. My grandfather was an early adopter, and he moved to an IBM PC fairly early on, and so we eventually, I think, got his Apple IIe. And so we had that for a while, and we started calling BBSs. Uh, we used to call BBSs on a 1200 baud modem. Um, you'll sometimes see, you know, I, I go to my BBS handles dealer, so you'll see that used a lot. And uh, uh, actually, I'm not sure it's from. We logged into an Apple II BBS. My dad, that's just what he put into my handle. I'm actually not even 100% sure where it came from. So. But uh, the local high school he taught at, they actually set up an Apple II BBS. They had it there, and they had a cider hard drive, and you, know, you can call into it and all that. And they, 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 this high school ran that BBS for years. Um, interesting enough, that for a while it was called Captain's School. So, you know, this is when I was, you know, elementary school. This is where the limit of my game writing abilities was. So, but luckily for this talk, I did get better eventually. So, uh, So I was just starting to, this was about, I guess, middle school time, and I uh, was starting to learn 652 assembly, but then uh, my family got a 386 around 1991 or so, and I moved to Turo Pascal and DOS, and so I just sort of stopped using the Apple II for a while. And in 1996, I went to college, and I uh, moved to Linux, and sort of moved to Linux permanently. And so in college, uh, my dad's high school, remember called the Apple IIs, he threw them all out in the late 90s, and so I managed to snag a... Uh, Apple II Platinum when they were throwing them out. So that's the machine I still use for my development. And when I was there, I found Usenet, and I was interested in looking at Apple II stuff, but for a reason at the time I was in, just the beginning of the endless September there, and it was just sort of a mess. There was plenty more, and it was a very friendly place, so I just sort of stayed away from Apple II development. But I never forgot that I really had always wanted to make a 6502 assembly game. So you might have heard one game I made was this game called Tom Bomb. So this was a game that, uh, around 2002 or so, I have a game, it was called you know, Tom Bomb, I wrote in DOS, in Pro Pascal, and it was just sort of a little fighter game. And I did it as part of a 1K, 1K programming challenge uh, they had online, and I, I couldn't actually fit the full version of the game in 1K, but I had a sample version of it, and I remember the, the make memory I have of this is I know I submitted it, and some Atari 2600 developer commented on it, and he's like, wow, it's got blocky graphics, and I'm like, wow, for an Atari 2600 programmer, that's uh, <laughs> sort of mean. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, I'm going to show that briefly. Um, and so, around this time, also, in order to get stuff onto the disk image, you know, I was doing development under Linux. So, uh, I used the CA65. Um, Assembler, and I, I wrote actually uh, tools, the DOS 3.3fs tools that let you mount a uh, disk image under Linux. And I actually wrote a file system journal for a while where you could actually mount your DOS 3.3 file system under Linux and you know use it like an actual file system. But I've been doing that for a while, so it's not working. But it also has some tools for uh, for uh, loading up the disk images and stuff. I'm going to use that still. And so you know, it's just sort of a silly game. And, it actually doesn't look like much, but it's the most complete port of this game there is. The actual DOS version is never finished, the Linux version is never finished, but this one you can actually play. So, you know, just a little game, and these things come down here and all that. So, so that was for a while uh, I'd worked on. And so later, this is around 2012, and this is where the software I'm using right now came from. So a co-worker of mine, I was at then I was at uh, doing a postdoc in Tennessee in Knoxville, and a co-worker, uh, 
you know, trying to be funny, uh, gave an entire week, we have a weekly lunch meeting, so he gave an entire presentation with his iPad. Uh, this is the place where they do the supercomputing stuff, so Linpack, you know, for the top 500 computers, and he actually is the one who ported Linpack to the iPad to show that, you know, the iPad is just as fast as a crate or whatever. It's like the end of the iPad. So my talk was a few weeks later, and so I thought I'd one-up him by bringing him Apple II in and giving an entire presentation on the Apple II. And, you know, that sort of got out of hand, and I ended up having writing an entire program that would take your slides that you made in a text, and it would actually make them to an AppleSoft basic program, and then set up things and do a little thing on the bottom here, and, and have the... Uh, build the graphics and all that. So, anyway, so that's the software I'm using here. I figured, you know, it's, if it's any place to use software like that, you know, this is the place. So, that's what I'm using here. And actually, so I started sending my projects into the Hackaday website, and this made it. And so, this project went mildly, not really viral, but a lot of people around the world got posted in some magazines and all that. So, and so a little bit later, you know, I moved on. After later, I moved to Maine and all that. And I started messing around with AppleSoft again because it's the first programming language I use, and I like using AppleSoft. And so I started trying to take modern things and sort of rewriting them in AppleSoft just to see how, you know, how well they run. And one, of the, one thing I did is I wrote a web server entirely in AppleSoft Basic with the Ethernet uh, card inside the Apple IIe. And it did all, everything in AppleSoft, all the peaks, everything was peaks and pokes and all that. It actually worked surprisingly well. You know, it actually wrote the images that's displaying off the disk. So when you made a request, you had, you'd hear the disk fire up and load it up and all that. And it worked well, but the main issue was the memory copy. Memory copy was really slow. And so, you know, if you put a routine in there in uh, assembly language to actually do memory copies, it's actually pretty nice. So, no demo of this now. It's not really an exciting demo, because especially because it takes long for it to load and all that. But it's on YouTube if you are curious about that. Another thing I did, I was playing the game Kerbal Space Program. And so I thought it'd be interesting to, to try to port that to basic. You know, these are just sort of joke ports and all that. but. Uh, so I did, and it actually surprisingly runs fairly well as long as you're only really doing things in 2D and don't care about the graphics that much. Uh, one thing that turned up was a bug in my basic tokenizer. Uh, I use ArcTangent for the first time, and you know it starts at AT, and so the, the token parser gets tripped up by at, like you know VLAN, whatever, at, whatever. And it was sort of interesting, so I was wondering how does AppleSoft handle this? And there's a clever way where you order the tokens right, and there's like a hack way where you put a special case for it, and it turns out AppleSoft actually uses the hack way, and so I have to do the mine too, where you actually use special case art tangent. So it's one of those things, like I'm always finding bugs in the tokenizer because I used something more obscure recently. Uh, it turned out that for years the, the parse for tab was broken because the actual document you find in the first Google search is missing the parentheses on it, and it hadn't run a program that had tab in it for ever apparently. Uh, another thing I did, this is the one I was most famous for, my 15 minutes of internet fame here, was play the game Portal. And so not the original Apple II game Portal, but the Valve one from later. And so I made that version of that in AppleSoft, and it was like a slow news week. And so uh, I actually interviewed for magazines like you know, The Register in England and a bunch of other stuff. And so yeah, you can uh, play the game, run around. Uh, and the game physics you can do in AppleSoft is actually not that bad. And a lot of the behavior you see in the game, and this naturally flows out of game physics, is sort of sort of seen too. So you can download that and play that. And at the end, when uh, you know when you beat the original game, it plays the, the song still alive, like a video. And so I, I of course put that into the Apple version of it. And you know, I just have peaks and pokes and basic and it sounded horrible. And so I'm like, man, this would sound so much better if I had a mockingboard card or something. And so that started a long tangent where I spent a lot of time. Uh, learning all about the Mockingboard and AY3 card and all that. So I tried to get a Mockingboard. It'd take actually a year for me to eventually get one. And so one thing I did instead is took a Raspberry Pi and hooked it up to essentially a Mockingboard board chip I built myself. And so I built a chiptune player. And so it's hard to see this, but it's, uh, it's got all these LEDs too, because like LED displays. Uh, my office, I actually built an entire Snapple to relate it, but you know, back to the future time circuits to my desk with all the LED displays and stuff that I had to get it going there. So, for this too, so this is how I learned. You know, people seem to think I sort of jumped straight into the Mockingboard and figured it out. I spent the whole year messing around with the Raspberry Pi, driving more or less the Mockingboard, and developing all the tools before I started doing the other stuff. And so around this time, my life got a little bit stressful. You know, my college professor, I was good for tenure and all that. And so I found 6502 assembly language coding to be very, very relaxing somehow. And so I started doing a bunch of uh, other programming, you know, when I should be doing other important things. So the one thing is the, this chiptune player that I mentioned. So, uh, let me close all the other windows. Yeah. Let's demo that real quick. Uh, 
So this is a tiptoe player, so uh, his plays mockingbird music. And so unlike uh, unlike the stuff we saw the other day where people are going from the MIDI angle converting it to mockingbird, uh, what I did is the uh, de demo scene and things like you know the Atari and the uh, Spectrum people, uh, they generated a file format called the YM5 format. Uh, based on their chips, and they, they have a lot of out there, there's all this chip tune music that I always thought was pretty amazing, and it uses the same chip as the Mockingboard, so there's no reason the Mockingboard can't play the songs like this. Uh, the problem is their format, it uses some weird compression, LHA compression, and it's interleaved to compress better. What it means is you really can't play the, you, you have 14 registers, you to write the Mockingboard, and they interleave them. And so to play them, you have to jump, constantly jump that far into the file, and so, uh, in order to get playing the Apple II and fit in 48K, when it's in 48K, it has to go and it like uh, compresses with LZ4 and, in chunks, and then while it's playing, it plays two of the chunks, and then it decompresses the third one while it's running, so we're up there. And so it's really complicated. But I mean, end result is you can play on a 140K disc, you can fit about a half an hour of music here. And it, while it's doing it, you know, it's got the little raster bars and the good stuff and all that. So, so uh, And this has got all these on here, so, but, uh, so that was one, one project I was working on. And there's some other things with that, so eventually I did finally get the, uh, I did eventually get the, get it all working, and I finally got an actual mocking board in the mail, and I start running it, and it actually doesn't sound that great. And so I've wasted weeks of my life trying to track this down, and I still haven't figured out exactly what it is. So it sounds great on the emulator, uh, but on a, the actual mocking board, there's very certain sequences of music you can send that glitches out the sound. And it doesn't happen with no regular songs. It only happens in these sort of extreme chip tune things. I've, limit, I've narrowed it down to a very certain uh, set of uh, data you send to it. And it almost looks like what happens is the way it works when it's counting out the frequencies, it counts, and when it hits the, the value, then it you know, resets and generates the waveform again. It seems like it's missing that. And so it somehow goes past it, then waits the whole way till the counter overflows, you know, a couple of milliseconds later to do that. And I still, so if there's any experts here on why this might be happening, it would be interesting to see. Um, and people have said, well, you know, maybe your code is doing it wrong and all that. And it could be true. It could be my code doing it wrong. The thing is, if my code is glitching in real hardware and not the emulator, well, that actually means that the emulator is not doing it right, rather than, you know, rather than real hardware. So it'd be interesting. I mean, you know, this has been bothering me for months now, but I still haven't, still haven't solved it. So the other thing I'm working on, that's the one that you know, I was mostly building up to here, is uh, I've been working on a game, and it's called Tablet Fantasy VII, and it's sort of silly. It's like a, not really quite a Final Fantasy clone, but it's based on the Final Fantasy games. And it's actually based on a bunch of college and high school inside jokes when I was in college and high school. Uh, Final Fantasy VII came out when I was in high school, and so my one friend who was playing, he was... Uh, psychology major. So unlike the rest of our roommates, we were engineers, we always had to work. You know, he had time to be playing video games and all that. So he'd play them, and what he actually do, he'd grind through the game whenever plot would happen. He'd yell, plot, we'd all run in to see the cutscenes and stuff. And we'd make up our own little things. So we'd make up some jokes about what the game would be like if, you know, our, us personally were in the game. And, you know, it's been 20 years. And, and so at this point, I thought, well, you know, I wonder how hard, just like my other, you know, basic games, like how hard could it be to make this? And I thought, ah, oh, I can turn this out in a week or so. It's been a year and a half, and it's still not quite done here. And I'm hoping to finish it for this. It's still not quite. But uh, I, have, I have some demo here to do it. And I was going to show a little bit about you know, how I developed these things. So let me go back here. So, uh, so I developed this under Linux, as you probably I had to reboot my laptop and all my windows got messed up. Let's see how this works. So what I have is I write it, I develop it on C under Linux, and I wrote some routines that are basically a graphics emulator that emulate you know, the Apple II graphics by reading the memory map and do this. And that way I can develop under Linux, and then debugging is a lot easier. You know, if you're trying to run things on the actual Apple II, something goes wrong, you know, trying to debug it. And even debugging in Apple Win, while well, it's gotten better, it's still a bit tricky. But here, you know, I can just stick printouts in my code, and I can get it mostly working in a very low level C, so I like 6502, and then I have to port it over, it's a lot easier, and I can make sure the algorithms go and all that. And it's actually, uh, you know, start out just as a low res emulator because uh, my graphics here are mostly in low res, but it can do high res now, and you'll see later I actually did some weird vapor lock stuff, and it can sort of roughly do that too. So this game, Final Fantasy VII, you know, that's 
supposed to be me, uh, sort of, and it'll symbol and whole sword was an LED, we're an electrical engineer, so we, the whole joke we had was, you know, all the swords would be different electrical components and all that. Uh, for this, it's only uh, this, and so you can pick your player, you can put in your name, I'm going to skip that. And so this is the one thing that, uh, you know, a lot of the games, my favorite part of it is just flying around above the scenery and all that. And so I thought, hey, can we do this Apple II? I was going to fake it out at first, and then I realized and looked at the math, like, you know, it might just barely be possible to do this. So this is, going, this is going a lot faster than it would in real hardware, but it is possible. I'll show the Mode 7 demo later. It actually has it. But, uh, so it is possible to do this, like Mode 7 type graphics. It takes a tile in the background, squishes it down, using a bunch of math, and then putting the sprite over it. And the trick to this is having a fast multiply. So you need to do, it's a fixed point 8.8 .8 multiply, so 16 by 16 and 32 multiply, which is really slow in a 6502. Like I think the best you can get is maybe like 700 to 1,000 cycles. But it turns out if you do some clever math, you can get this down to about 200 cycles. Uh, and the way you do this, it's, it's sort of not complicated, but people figured that a long time ago. But if you do the quadratic formula and stuff, you can change the, uh, you can change the two multiplies into a lookup table of, in a table of squares and change it to a lookup and some subtractions. And you have to waste two kilobytes of RAM for a lookup table, but then you can get the multiplies down to 200 cycles or so. And so seven multiplies for each pixel, you can, uh, get the screen, and so by doing this, you can get, you know, I cheated a bit, and I'll calculate from up here and stuff, but you can get about, about 10, 10 frames a second or something, which is actually pretty nice. So, uh, and so yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about later, but then, you know, you can land your ship, and you get out and walk around and all that, and, and I think that effect should be possible if implemented that yet, but using the same code, and then, you know, you're fighting, and, you know, you can attack, and, uh, Let's see here. I should have sped this up for the demo so I actually get to do some attacks. And you can do summons and stuff. And some of these are sort of joke summons, like Metrocat. Uh, there was a why isn't the keyboard working here? No, it's not going to work, is it? Oh, vortex cannon. So some of these things, like we built this thing like a metro, uh, vortex cannon, which is a box, serial box you hit, and it shoots, you know, uh, air at people like that. Uh, we had one of those in our dorm and it was, we thought it was funny. The other thing Metro Cat there was he was a cat that appeared and covered the Washington Post Metro section. We thought he was cool looking and hung him up and then we eventually ran him for SJ president of the college and all that twice. He never won, but the second time they actually banned writing candidates because we were causing trouble and all that. So, and it's another random encounter here. Uh, there's only in my room, there's only like 10 different enemies. You know, I, try, I want this to run in 48 kilobytes. So, uh, Let's see, the metric cat here, yeah, the cat comes and gets me and all that. So, uh, fitting it's hard, actually the hard part's me the dialogue, you know, getting text on the Apple II is a bit hard. Let me get over here to the, so here when you go into places, this is sort of based on the University of Maryland, and this is, it's called Talbot Fantasy, we live in Talbot Hall, which is like this, we can go in here and we can talk to the people and all that, and, you know, and a lot of these are, are silly inside jokes. They're playing the Super Nintendo there, you probably can't tell. So these people are famous people. This guy right here these days, he's an Ivy League college uh, math professor. And this guy here is actually a higher up guy at Firaxis, you know, the civilization programming people. And this guy here, he's a high-end lawyer now. So it's sort of funny uh, how these things all work out. But, and you can go to some of these places. And I was having fun with the, uh, I mean, I hate to sneak through here. Uh, and I can skip the battles currently because it's debug. I was having fun with some of the scenery and making, you know, pretty scenery and all that low res. So I just throw these all, you know, with, with you know, regular paint program and bring them in and all that. So, so showing this, just, you know, showing off the this is. And so the plan is to eventually, uh, you know, the, the plan is eventually to uh, get this going on the Apple II. I was hoping to have it done by here, but it isn't. If you go play it now, the disk image is there. Uh, you can do the flying part, you can walk around the scenery part, but that's about it. But I've got all the art done finally, and I've got all the logic done, which is the hard part. And so the you know the next part, the rest is uh, trying to get it in six five two assembly and all that. And I also have some some mockingbird music I want to play at various times. And uh, actually, from the Final Fantasy seven, I found the sheet music, and it actually sounds surprisingly good on on the mockingbird. But again, trying to fit this all in forty eight k, especially it's probably gonna be big enough I get to load from disk, so I can't overwrite DOS. And so it'll be a challenge, but I think it should be. You know, I think it should be possible. So, and the other thing, uh, the credits. The credits are the interesting part, and this is the thing I got done, actually did get done before coming here, and I was going to show it off here. So, you know, at the end, in a lot of the games, you're, uh, 
you know, they show you riding off since the sunset, off and riding in the game, you know, in a chocobo or something, which is a giant bird creature and all that. And I thought I should do this. And uh, so, but it'd be cool, you know, low res isn't that great, so why can't we do it with this? So this is split screen, this is text on the top, high res in the middle, low res here. It's doing the vapor lock or finds where it is. So cycle counting, you get here, flips in the off screen. And it's a fun idea. Thanks. So it's playing, uh, playing some, uh, I don't know if you can hear that, but it's playing some Mockingbird music too, so. But uh, yeah, this is the most challenging programming I've done. I was going to take that back. It's the most challenging program I've done that worked pretty easily the first time. I've, I've been trying to do some ARM assembly language setting up the caches on the Raspberry Pi is about 10,000 times worse. But So anyway, uh, yeah, and just repeats here. But, so, uh, I like doing this because I imagine if I went back in time to you know, the 80s and showed my young self this, I would be like, that's not possible or whatever. So it's, uh, I'll repeat here forever though. But So yeah, that'll, uh, that'll, that'll play over the end credits when you beat the game. So uh, A few other things. So the Mode 7 demo, I'll show that in a minute. I'll show it last because Apple Win, the sound on Apple, the current version of Apple Win, if you put speaker, PC speaker, and my PC, the, the speaker and the mocking board at the same time, it glitches out for some reason. So I'll be, have to play a different way. Uh, so that one, though, that was when I, when I made, originally made the flying part. It was so cool. I'm like, you know, this would make a good demo, like demo scene demo. And, you know, I didn't really know much about the demo scene, except, you know, I'd seen the, the future reality demo and some other things. So I hacked together something, you know, if it could be a demo scene demo. I like to add raster bars and the start field and, and the greets and all that. I did that. I also wrote it up, so the most recent of the, the journal, I didn't put this full screen again, the, uh, uh, the proof of concept or GTFO. <laughs> Journal you may have heard of, a hacker journal. So uh, the most recent one, actually, I actually have an article on my Mode 7 domains in there. You can go read it. And you can read it on my website. I have a slightly, a slightly more elaborate version of that uh, paper that uh, you know, they, they kept it a little small for the journal. So some extra stuff on, on things. So uh, I'll run that at the end. As I said, I can run it for an emulator. The other thing is messing around with, and I had some help from some people who are here because uh, this is the entropy demo. You may see me running it earlier. And so this is from the Beagle Brothers. Uh, two-line basic demo from years ago, and so I guess I can actually run it and show it. So it's a uh, it's a cool table. <laughs> X draws it and X draws it across, and then randomly it makes it bigger, and that's when you get these weird shapes. And then it overwrites it again. When you overwrite it again, you get the, the double box, and it goes back and forth. And now we just started as a cool little demo. And so uh, we got it down. We have it's what we got too. But not much bigger than 100 bytes or so. So it's sort of a fun little demo. So you know, I got on the demo scene thing, you know little old for this, but it's starting in the demo scene uh, type stuff. So just a cool little demo on the side there. And uh, yeah, I'll get back to the questions. Like, let me run the, let me run the mode seven demo now. So uh, I'm gonna run that in MAME because the sound, I guess, might matter in this case, the sound is sort of going. So, uh, So demo, so it's loading. I actually loaded the high, the high, uh, high res memory so you can see it loading. And if you look carefully, you can see my little logo up there. So the code actually has that pattern in it. Uh, so it had my logo, so I did you know, spread it across the high res pages. And it uh, has a scrolling text there. And just like a lot of demos do. It fades out. That was a lookup table to do that. And then it has a little bouncing geometric shape because you do it in demos. But then you know, it starts rotating with the so the mode seven code, you can actually do any background you want, tile map, you know, here it's doing a checkerboard, but you can do earlier you saw the map. And it's playing mockingboard music in the background. So all this fits in 8K, including all the music. So it's compressed, it's all in eight kilobytes. And you know, it's flying across the scenery here, just like you saw before. So this is the frame rate you can get on, on this in the game if you're actually playing the game, that you didn't get as good as you looked before. And then you also need a star field because you know, there's a demo, so you're flying through the star field. Flags off, and then of course you have to have some raster bars and thank all your contributors and stuff. And so, and then I tried this, this isn't, you know, splitting here, I just used inverse text to make it look like it was in the graphics mode there. 
And so playing this, this is a random assortment. And when, when you see people being thanked in demos, it's always a way to who these people are. And so this is some random people I knew in high school and uh, various things I did, like uh, various BBSs I ran and things like that. So, but, uh, and the music, I didn't write this music. If anyone out there is a good Mockingbird music player, you know, that'd be great to have help. Uh, I found this one online, some Russian guy. I could never contact and ask for permission. So hopefully I don't get the Russian Russian mob after me at some point for stealing uh, <laughs> YM5 music at some point. And the reason I don't use MAME for this more often, I always had trouble closing this. Uh, there we go. Uh, so, yeah, I've actually finished a little earlier than I meant. So uh, any, any questions on any of that stuff? Um, I can go back and in a little bit of time I can show some of the basic programs. I was interested in my time for them. So any questions on anything? For the table of squares, did you pre-calculate that or did you have that done? Uh, it's, it's generated on the fly. It doesn't, I'm pretty sure it's generated on the fly. It doesn't take that long. I have to double check, but I'm pretty sure it generated on the fly. It uses a lot of self-modifying code too. So, it, you know, it, uh, and because of the way the, uh, most seven equations work, you don't need all the high bits. So it also, you know, I, I spent a lot of time optimizing it. So it also, it throws away a lot of the results and all that. And that's, that's part of how you get down to 200, 200, by 200 cycles or so. Yeah. Yes? For anyone who might not know Super Nintendo, can you explain what Mode 7 actually is? Oh, yes, yes. So yeah, Mode 7, it's called Mode 7 because that's what they call it the Super Nintendo. I've actually done some minor Super Nintendo developing at various points. So what it is, is the, uh, I should have made some actual slides for, for the mode 7. So uh, you have a tile map, so uh, you know, grid of the tiles with the data on it, and it transforms it, so it can transform it. Uh, it sort of, the, the, the actual Super Nintendo hardware does this in hardware, and it, it can do some pretty elaborate like, rotates and shifting to make it look like 3D by taking it and sort of shifting it back and squishing it in a bit. And so what what this does, the code does, is it actually goes and it walks across the screen and it finds each pixel on the screen, where would this be in the tile map if I you know, rotate and squish it, it looks sort of 3D-ish. And so what it does for each of those things, it first it calculates you know, where in the tile it is and looks up the lookup table. And for you know, more advanced things, the tiles can have you know, really complicated graphics and look really nice. Here, I'm just using like a 64 by 64 tile map. Each one's a solid color, so you probably notice that the checkerboard one, you know, that's the size of, of the thing. Uh, I also made a, someone's like, oh, you should make it look, go into double high res. And so I'm like, oh, that wouldn't be too bad because when I calculate, so I threw it together in a day and then they were like shocked. Like I can spend my whole life trying to get double, make double the res working and how'd you do it in one day? The thing is, the way you're drawing it to go from single to double, I just had to shift over by one pixel and then write it to the aux page and it actually wasn't that much trouble. The way is the graphics are sort of grainy as they are, so they look mildly better, at least what I was using in, in double low res, but they're not, you know, great, and your, your frame rate goes in half, so it's not really worthwhile to do the double low res for that. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, so my, my code, it's all there. Uh, I am increasingly inaccurately named DOS 3.3 FS programs uh, GitHub tree that I actually put everything in. It actually annoys people sometimes. They just want to get games and stuff, and they have to get download the whole thing. But uh, that is my website there, uh, off there. So the code for everything I showed, it's, I, I, I open source everything. The code's all there, so if you want to look at it, it's all there, free for download and all that. Uh, in general, sometimes it's hard to build things not in Linux just because it's where I build it. And you have to have the CA65 assembler installed usually to, to build things. But uh, I also have disk images there too if you don't want to build things yourself. So, other questions? Uh, I can. I think I have a little bit of time here. I can show off real quick. Uh, uh, what do you want to see? Request? Model 2? Portal. Oh, Portal 2. Oh, Portal. Yeah, yeah. I can't, let me show you Portal. Uh, I called it uh, GLADOS 3.3. It was a DOS 3.3 pod, and no one, no one actually picked up on it really about it, but that's what it's called. So, yeah, Portal. <laughs> yeah, you guys do. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, it isn't basic, so it takes a little bit to reload, but he's got here. 
I always put a crack screen on it because, you know, growing up, I actually never played many games that I shouldn't admit this, didn't have crack screens on them, so I just figured that's what games had on them when you started the game. <laughs> so yeah, so there you are, your uh, shell there, and let me see around the keys, so yeah, like, and it's actually a really a painful interface to shooting the portals. Uh, you have to go over with the IJK keys to what you want to do, so. It's talking there, and you can see the completed companion cube up there, and trying to remember how do I shoot. Okay, there's one, and let's come down here, and let's shoot the other and see if bad things happen. Yep, so you know, it shoots through the portal, and it kills me, and it's like, you died, try again. And... Let's see if we can do something useful with the portal here, so... Let's see if we can get it go across the lake here. So yeah, this is actually isn't very much, isn't actually very much AppleSoft code. It's actually, let's see if we make this jump here. Yeah, go through. So, you know, the physics isn't much. You know, it's just some gravity, and I have some special cases for laser and stuff. And it skips, I always joke, you know, like half an hour later in the video, but you know, I only have the two levels here, and then you're at the final, final battle here and all that. And uh, I'll sit here and play through the whole thing here, but, uh, so people say, can you add mouse support, joystick support? Uh, you could. It sort of makes everything a lot more complicated. And then people are saying, you know, uh, you know, why don't you do this in assembly language? And uh, at the time, it was like, uh, didn't seem like worth the trouble. But I have another demo I didn't show. Uh, some people might have seen it playing upstairs last night, uh, where I made the, the still live at the end. I did finally eventually, oh, missed. Uh, I did finally. Uh, get that going on the Mockingboard, with the Mockingboard sound. And to do that, in order to make a nice 16K demo, I actually re-implemented this very scene right here. Oh, sorry, I'm putting the wrong place. I, I re-implemented this scene in uh, assembly language. And so it's not too bad. Uh, part of the problem was, you know, it's just using xDraw. That's actually an interesting thing with this right here, is uh, I'm xDrawing the shapes, even her. And so in order for that to work, she can only go into even on even things, and the background has to be the right color of black, so she's orange and blue. If she accidentally gets off by a thing, someone should be green and purple. And so it's sort of, uh, you know, sort of annoying. So, uh, any other questions? You know, I have a few more minutes here. If anything else you want to see, this is the, uh, it's not that exciting to here watch me playing Portal and, and uh, anything else. I could probably show Kerbal Space Program really quickly if anyone wants to see that one. Yeah, it's to load it high because this one got too big. And if you ever played the original Kerbal before it originally got taken over by you know big companies, the loading screen looked like. And it's actually not doing anything here. It's just faking a long loading screen just because that's what the original game did. And it's got the graphics to be squint a bit. And it's a little humorous thing, so the actual game does. And this is actually also sort of why I got interested in Mocky Board Sound too, because it plays the scene, the theme here, but you know, just to take some posts. And there's a Mocky Board version of this I posted too that you can go see. And you know, you're in an assembly building. And you can build things, you know, in the game you build this graphically, but here, you know, uh, you just say, you know, parts and it you know it's really simplified. This is a very lousy rocket, it's gonna explode. Uh, how many parachutes, how many struts. The game, if you play the game, the joke is you build a lot of struts to hold things together. So, And you can pick what your pilot is. And so we can pick Jebediah. And it says my thrust to rate ratio is like 0.3 here, which means it's not going to take off. But we can pretend. And in the game, you can see a little window here on your pilot. And he like smiles or frowns based on what's going on. And I can watch it here, and it's going to crash right away, probably, because yeah, it explodes. And he's looking sad because his rocket is exploding. Uh, so anyway, that's that's that. This again, it's all it's all basic, you know. Lots and lots of basic. So, uh, any last questions? No. Thank you.
minutes, we have our next talk, so there's a very brief break. Got it. No, he's wearing it. That's how it works. This guy is an amateur, I swear. Well, that is perfection. Episodes with Ken and them. A very special episode. They're all very special episodes. Ready to get mics yet? Is, is sound important to what you're doing? Not in the slightest. Good. Because to do sound, we're going to basically have to hold the microphone, the other microphone down to here. We can't get them both to mix in here. Oh, okay. Is that because I took your Y splitter? No, because I tried using the Y splitter and it just like, plugged this in and we get the sound from the computer, but no microphone. Ah. Even though it's plugged, they're both plugged in the splitter, it should work, but it's failing for some reason. It makes no sense to me. Interesting. Right. You're falling, you're falling into the. Uh, trap of what happens when a person has a cool thing is they they, they they get it working and then they're like man oh it barely runs okay it's running now what if it had this now while it's running oh it's broken again and people come in they go it's, it looks broken yeah it's been broken all day I don't know why so there's like all sorts of like stuff that can respond to what's being done video processing and then shove it in with the secondary scenes. But if you want to do that right now, I just please, I just realized with the sound thing where we have it set up. I don't want it to kind of run in a different way. But on the other hand, you know what to do? Um I I shut away and look in that direction. They naturally do stuff and they'll turn. Yes, and it's a UV drive, so I can have my presentation right on there. <laughs> Aptly chosen. Yeah. 
I've never been very good at placing these. Yeah. How's that? Yeah. And just turn it on. Yeah, the addition is linked to this. Oh, okay. Oh, I hear you. Is that good? Introduction. All right, so it's time for our second talk. This is Ken Gagney, who is glowing infinitum with blogging. Hey. Good morning. Thank you for coming to the second talk of the first full day of the 30th Kansas Fest. Appreciate your patience, alertness, and more patience. So I'm here today to talk to you about not just GS, which you may be familiar with me from, or such films as Fever Pitch and Disc, but blogging, <laughs> blogging about the Apple II. Uh, let's see, I want to talk to you a little bit about my own blog to start and how you can replicate its fantastic success and how you can come up with ideas of things to say about the Apple II because I've seen so many fantastic hardware and software programs. Dieter's Mode 7 demo is amazing. We've written about that and Portal and Kerbal all in JuiceGS, but not all of us have that particular level of talent. We may strive for it, and some of us may achieve it, but not all of us are cut out to be hardware developers. We might not be soldering masters like Vince Briel. We might not be software developers or crackers or uh, even magazine layout artists, but we all have something to say. We all have stories to share, and blogging is one of my favorite ways to share your own stories. And I'd like to give you the tools you need to tell your story online. So my own blog is where I tell my stories and I want to tell you why I created yet another Apple II blog when there are already so many out there. So back around like eight years ago my two favorite sources for Apple II stories were a2central.com was the first one and at one point Sean Fahey posted a great story about how he was introduced to the Apple II as a room on a microphone. It was a really funny story, and I really got to know more about Sean from that story. But it wasn't what I went to A2 Central looking for. I thought this was a news website, and it seemed surprising to find a personal narrative there. I thought that would be a great story to share on somebody's personal blog. So I thought A2 Central, isn't that for news? That's what I was going there for. There is also the Juice GS website, which as a result of a Kansas Fest presentation and uh, set of focus group, added a blog. And I told the Juice GS staff, if you ever have anything you want to contribute to the Juice GS blog, you're welcome to. It doesn't have to be all me. So Ryan Suenaga contributed a blog post, and before I published it, I read it, and it had nothing to do with Juice GS. And I said, Ryan, how does this tie into the website of the magazine you're publishing it on? And he said, you didn't say it had to. It's just about the Apple II. And I'm like, well, OK, you got me there, but it's not really a good fit. So I didn't publish that either, because the JuiceGS blog is for blog posts about JuiceGS. So I started thinking, well, OK. So I, I have pigeonholed these two topics. Where do people publish stuff like that? So I started developing my own Apple II website. I had some help from Peter Watson, who introduced me to WordPress in the first place. And I spent the summer of August 2009 building this website had it done, but I, I didn't have anything to say myself, or so I thought. So there was this whole website that was just completely blank for like eight or nine months, until April 2010, when, you know what happened in April 2010, is Gizmodo found an iPhone in a bar, an unreleased prototype, and Apple seized it back. And there were all these news stories about it, including a news story by Jon Stewart. Uh, he was host of The Daily Show, and he did this mock-up, and it shows him back in his college days using an Apple II. I thought, oh, that's really cool, but where can I share this? Where can I tell people, hey, the Apple II showed up on The Daily Show? And I was like, oh, I'll use my own blog. So I wrote a blog post about this, and I'm like, okay, I can't just push, publish one blog post. I published this on a Monday. I was like, well, I'll do a blog post every Monday, and maybe every Thursday as well. So for the first three years, I published two blog posts a week, and then I cut back to once a week, and I've been doing it every single Monday for the last eight years, writing this Apple II blog post. So I had to figure out what categories am I going to put these posts in. And I came up with several categories, hacks and mods for writing about hardware, happenings for covering events like Kansas Fest, history for saying, hey, I just found out something cool that happened 30 years ago, or here's something about the Apple II that you might not know. Uh, mainstream coverage for like The Daily Show or if USA Today mentions the Apple II or something else. Musings is what Jeopardy would call potpourri. It's just like, mm, here's something I thought of. Uh, people, 
for blog posts are actually about people in the Apple II community or the Apple II industry and legacy. Software showcase for writing about software, and then tips and tricks for, hey, here's something cool you can do with your Apple II. And over the last eight years, as I have continued to develop content for this blog post site, I've added three more categories organically, uh, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Game Trail. So two specific people, and then also a specific genre of software, that being games, because I like games. And now looking back at how I've used these 11 categories, uh, the most popular one is games, followed by mainstream coverage, history, and musings. Uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak are both pretty popular. Obviously, there's more to say about Woz than Jobs. Uh, and I've only used the tips and tricks category once. So in hindsight, I probably should have not used that category at all, because I have nothing useful to tell you about how to use an Apple II. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, I have written many posts, and here are the five most popular posts, and when they were published. Uh, the Art of Apple. Actually, I'm sorry, that's a typo. It should be The Art of Atari. Cliff Spohn wrote a book about the art of Atari and all the beautiful covers that those games used to have. And he did some art for Apple as well. And that's mentioned in the book. So I wrote a blog post about that. That is my number one most popular blog post. Just wrote it last year. Taking the Apple II online with Ethernet when I got my first <coughs> internet card, my first Ethernet card. Best computer games from the 1980s. The differences between a ROM 1 and a ROM 3 and how to tell the difference and The Art of the Crack, which is Jason Scott's upload to the Internet Archive of all Apple II crack screens. I wrote a blog post about that. And these categories are musings, hacks and mods, game trail, more hacks and mods, and software. So a good mix. So I've been writing these blog posts and hundreds of others for the last eight years. How do I always have something interesting to say, or I hope it's interesting to me, to say about the Apple II? I want to tell you how I got my ideas and how you can get ideas yourself. I would say my creative juices were sparked by two main sources. The first was grad school. I went to Emerson College in Boston while I was working as an editor at Computer World Magazine. I was going for a master's degree in publishing. So I was publishing a magazine by day and studying how to publish magazines by night. Maybe a little bit backwards, but it worked for me. So I did that for three years. And in my second year, in the spring, I took a course called Column Writing. It was groundbreaking for me. It was taught by Professor Jeffrey, Jeffrey Seglin, who is now at Harvard University at the Harvard Kennedy School. And we were 10 students workshopping with each other. We would bring to class columns that we had written that were 500 words each. And we'd share them with the class, and we'd talk about what we liked, what we didn't like, how we could improve them. We bring them home, revise those drafts, bring them back, even submit them for publication, which is pretty cool. And the semester started by asking us, what are we going to write about? And there was a great exercise that Professor Seglin gave us about how to come up with ideas. And that exercise, that handout, is actually, with his permission, available in a handout that I'm making available to you online. Uh, this URL will also be at the beginning and end of the presentation. It's kgagney.com slash kfest2018. It's a double-sided handout, so if you see mentions to resources or links in this presentation, they're mostly in the handout as well, so you don't have to worry about taking notes or catching on the live stream later. Uh, it was basically go to someplace like Barnes & Noble, look at all the magazines that are being published, choose three magazines that you like, and come up with six topics that you would want to pitch to that magazine. So come up with 18 ideas. You don't have to write the whole column. Just say, hey, if I was to email the editor-in-chief with a pitch, an elevator pitch for something I want to write about, here's what that story would be. Six ideas each for three different magazines. And then we brought those ideas to class. We workshopped them. At the end of the semester, we did the same exercise again. We went back to the bookstore, looked at the magazines. And it was great. I was pitching ideas for uh, like the Vegetarian Times or Bicycling Magazine and all things that I've never written about but I find fascinating. I was like, what if there was an article on this topic? Because as we learned yesterday from Roger Wagner, the best time to write a book is while you're still learning the subject. So what would you want to say about bicycling that you just learned? Or what would, do you want to learn about bicycling, for example? And do that. You can write an article about how the Apple Macintosh was originally supposed to be called the Apple Bicycle and how that correlates. I don't know. The, so this was a huge boost for my uh, creative energy. The other one comes from The Moth. Anybody here ever listen to The Moth? 
a handful of people. Cool. So this is a live event and a podcast hosted by NPR. And it was recommended to me by Kansas Fest alumnus, uh, Sierra Saunter, back in December 2012. She's like, have you ever heard of this story slam? And I thought, it has the word slam in the title. It's probably too hipster for me. But I ended up really liking it. it so at the moth, people are invited to come up on stage and share a true five-minute story from their own lives in which they are the protagonist. They are given a theme, so the story has to fit a theme. And that's very similar to writing something for a magazine. It has to fit a theme. You don't just get up there with an open mic and say whatever you want. It has to be focused on a specific topic. And at the moth, they have to, the stories have to be five minutes long. And as I've learned from years of transcribing interviews for Juice GS and Computer World, human speech is about 100 words a minute. So five minutes of speech is 500 words, which is the same length as a column, which I learned to write at Emerson. So I was getting up at the moth, I was telling stories, I was writing columns for Juice GS, for Computer World, for my class, and it was all very similar structures. Beginning, middle, and end has to have a narrative weave and I've really enjoyed telling stories at the Moth. I've become a frequent storyteller. Uh, these are four of my stories. The topics or the themes were happy, do-over, accidents, and love hurts. I've also told stories on chemistry, office, and now or never. Uh, I made it to the Grand Slam in Boston and actually tied for first place. So that was where like, they invite back the previous winners for the best of the best. And I made my mark there. And the Apple II has actually been a source of inspiration. Half of the stories right here are about the Apple II. Happy and Do-Over are about the Apple II. And the accident story, that's the only one you can actually see just by Googling like Ken Gagney Moth. The other stories are all behind passwords, but the accident story is free for the public to find. So I'm coming up with all these stories all the time. And if you're looking for stories to tell, here are some sources you might look for, which I have found useful, is Something that happened at Kansas Fest, somebody you met at Kansas Fest, a session you attended at Kansas Fest, something you found inspirational or something you want to explore further, even to like a note to yourself, hey, I just picked up this book, I'm looking forward to reading it. Something you bought on eBay, hey, I found this really weird card, I don't know what it does, can anybody help me identify it? Or I've never had a mockingboard before and now I do, here's what I'm going to do with it. Responding to a magazine article. One of the most overlooked resources at the Garage Giveaway, in my opinion, are the stacks and stacks of magazines. Because there isn't that volume of content being produced about the Apple II nowadays. You can pick up one issue of Soft Talk, it's like 100 pages, read all the articles, and there's like seven or eight blog posts you could write from that. Like saying, hey, here's what's happened since that article was published, here's something I'm going to try, here's something I never knew, and just share that with the world. You listen to a podcast. There's so many podcasts about retro computers. There's Open Apple, the Retro Computing Roundtable, the Retro MacCast, One Megahertz, so many others. You could listen to a podcast and just say, "Hey, I, I found this episode and I really enjoyed it." Uh, personal stories. You know, here's something that happened to me when I was growing up. Here is the first time I found an Apple II when my dad brought me to work. Here's the educational lab that I learned about the Apple II in elementary school and what it was like to have an Apple II at school and not at home or vice versa. A weekend project. You're probably going to co go home from Kansas Fest inspired with lots of ideas. And you're going to spend a weekend just hacking at something. You'll, you'll upload a personal diary to say, hey, here's how far I've made it this week in Lawless Legends, for example. Uh, modern projects inspired by the Apple II, like uh, Raspberry Pi is a small, constrained, educational device just like an Apple II. Here's something that you could do that is like that. Or there's a new Bard's Tale coming out. There's a third Wasteland game coming out. Those are franchises that started on the Apple II. What do you think about the new Bard's Tale? Are you going to play it? Have you played it? Did you name your characters the same thing you did in the original game? Did you port your characters over from 30 years ago? And also, Google Alerts. You can set up a Google alert for any time the phrase Apple II is mentioned on the internet, you get a ping. Or any time VisiCalc or Steve Wozniak. You can, if somebody wants to set up a website called wozwatch.com, where you report on every public appearance Steve Wozniak makes, I would love that. Uh, that was an idea that Paul Zaleski suggested to me here at Kansas Fest like 10 years ago. And I was like, I should do that. Even though Steve Wozniak has his own website, you can do it better than him. 
<laughs> and that'd be creepy. <laughs> Now, not everything you find, not everything you want to write about is going to be a good fit for your own personal blog. For example, if you get a ping about Apple II showing up in a news story, sometimes the Apple II is mentioned to give something else context, but the story isn't about the Apple II. Like, they might open by saying, the year was 1977, the Apple II was new, and so-and-so was about to embark on their adventure. You know, the story's not about the Apple II. They're just saying, hey, this is how old things were back then. This is what was happening. So, for example, I recently saw a story about someone who used to write property management software for the Apple II back in the 80s, and he just got an award for Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Apartment Association. I didn't really feel like there was a story there. It was just, okay, he is now a realtor, and he did this thing 30 years ago. So that was a tweet, not a 500-word blog post. Or sometimes the story might I have found to be so big that it outgrows my blog. So for example, I started writing an art, a blog post about here's how to buy something on eBay. And I was like, if I really want to do this comprehensively, that's not going to be 500 words. And so it became a full-fledged Juice GS article that somebody else wrote. Or when Steve Godzilla, Steve Godzilla, former head of the Kansas Fest Committee, passed away a year or two ago, I started writing a little tribute to him on my blog, and then I realized not everybody who knew him is going to see this. I should put this in Juice GS. And so it became my editorial for the next quarterly issue. And other stories, like I said, are just too big or too broad appeal. Recently, Microsoft bought GitHub. And I started just writing a little blog post. I said, hey, here are all the Apple II users who use GitHub that are affected by this. And as I started researching, I realized, wow, there are a lot of people who use GitHub. And I'm like, mm, maybe this should be in just yes. So, so I reached out to all of those people who I was listing and said, what do you think about Microsoft buying your GitHub. And they wrote back, and that became a JuiceGS article. And there are still other stories that I've started to write in similar fashion that I realized, oh, this is going to be big, and I'm still working on that for JuiceGS. So you have all these ideas, I hope, or you know where to find them. How do you get them out into the world? Well, you won't be surprised that I would suggest that you use WordPress. WordPress is a content management system that was invented in 2003. It is now 15 years and two months old, just turned 15 in May, and it powers 31% of all new websites that launch. Of websites that use a CMS, because not all websites do, but of the CMS market, it has a 60% share. More than half of all websites that use a CMS are using WordPress. And one of the reasons it's so popular, several of the reasons, are because it's free, it's open source, meaning that you can modify it and distribute it however you like, and it's not tied to a corporation. So unlike Wix, Weebly, or Squarespace, you're not tied to a corporation and their profits and their continued existence. If Squarespace goes out of business, they're probably going to take your website with them. And even if you export your content, you'll never again see the engine, the user interface that you used to build that website because it was proprietary. The company that makes, or the company associated with WordPress could go out of business tomorrow and your website will be fine. So that's very encouraging. You can, you can customize it, you can modify it however you want, as I mentioned. It has an extensive plugin architecture, which means you can extend it in all different ways to make it do things it was never meant to do, kind of like the seven slots in the Apple II. Um, my website is running on WordPress and I used to host it on DreamHost, which is very affordable. They're kind of like GoDaddy, which you may have heard of. Uh, I've since moved it to WP Engine, uh, but I still use DreamHost for some things, so either of those is fine. I find WP Engine a little bit more expensive, but also a little bit more stable. And I should offer the full disclosure that I work for Automatic, hence the shirt. Uh, they are the company that makes WordPress.com, which is the commercial version. You can go to WordPress.com and set up your own free blog immediately, but then there are paid add-ons, like a freemium model, and those upgrades are how Automatic, the company that makes WordPress.com, makes money. Uh, WordPress.com's CEO is the inventor of WordPress, but WordPress itself is free and open source. Now, I'm not here as a representative of my company. They would not send me to an Apple II convention. Uh, I'm here on my own. I'm representing myself. And also, I have given presentations about WordPress before at Kansas Fest six years ago. I did a talk in July of 2012, WordPress for Dummies. And even six years before that, 
is when I started using WordPress, when Syndicom Online closed, that was a web-based and telnet-based online service for Apple II users. I ran several forums or fora on that service. <clears throat> and when it closed in 2006, I was like, what am I going to do now? And Peter Watson, there's that name again, said, why don't you start a blog? And so I looked up WordPress, I started using that. So I've been using WordPress for 12 years, and I've only been working for the WordPress company for six months. So I was an enthusiast and an evangelist well before I was an employee. Pardon me why. Hydrate. Any questions? Good, I hate questions. Okay, so. I talked about content generation, ideas. You want to marry the content with the presentation. You want it to look like an Apple II website, whatever that may mean to you or to your readers. I use a theme called Retro Mac OS by Stuart Brown. It was released in 2010, so it's an eight-year-old WordPress theme, which doesn't exactly follow modern design standards. It was actually adopted as an official theme that WordPress.com users could use in October of 2011. Does anybody know why that date? Two days earlier, Steve Jobs had passed away. And the CEO of Automatic said, let's pay tribute to Steve Jobs by letting people make their website look like a retro Mac. And so this is what it looked like, or this is what my website would look like using that theme. Uh, it's a classic Mac, black and white interface, so early version of Mac OS. It's got uh, the icons. Uh, the Apple icon, the upper left. Ooh. But there are some things I didn't like about it, which was the content column was kind of narrow. It was black and white. The icons were all generic. They were not representative of what you were actually clicking on. And, of course, as the name implies, retro Mac, not retro Apple. But WordPress is customizable. So using what's called a child theme, I was able to modify this to be a little bit more representative of an Apple II. Now we're using Apple II icons. Each icon ties into what you're clicking on. It's in color. The main content column is wider. And it's just more representative of what my blog is about. The content is about the Apple II. The theme looks like an Apple II. They're wed together. However, you can still use the Retro Mac theme if you want. And in fact, other websites do. Uh, Lawless Legends uses the Retro Mac theme. So you can go to their website, and it might look similar to mine. You might wonder why. It's because we're using the same parent theme. I've heavily modified mine, but originally it looked like that. Now, this theme, as I mentioned, is a little bit on the older side, and has since been retired. The, uh, you can't use it on WordPress.com anymore. The official website where I downloaded it eight years ago is not available anymore. Uh, I found it somewhere else online, and you can download it from kgadney.com slash retromacOS. That's just a redirect link that will send you to somebody else's site where I found it. Since it is an older theme, it is not what is called responsive. A responsive theme means that the theme, the website automatically adapts to whatever size of screen it's being displayed on. Whether it's a laptop, a 5K monitor, an iPad tablet, an iPad mini, an iPhone, whatever size it is, a responsive website looks good on anything. Uh, my site, by default, does not look very good on mobile. It looks like this. It looks exactly like it does on the desktop, which means a lot of pinching and zooming to be able to read the text. That is not an optimal experience. Uh, WordPress offers a plugin called Jetpack, which will enable a mobile version of your website, and that looks like this. Now, the downside to Jetpack is that every website that uses Jetpack's mobile feature will look like this. It's generic. It doesn't, it's not customized to your theme. So people visiting my website on their mobile device won't see all that Apple II customization I did, but at least they'll be able to read it. And to, uh, so far, although mobile traffic to my website is increasing year over year, it's still predominantly desktop. So for now, I'm okay with this. If you want to use WordPress, I mentioned Jetpack as a plugin. There are some others that I briefly want to mention because plugins are great. They make everything better. Uh, and they're going to be, I could do a whole talk on Kansas Fest about WordPress. This is just sort of a brief encapsulation. And again, these are listed in my handout as well. But a kismet block spam, whether that being a comment on your blog or somebody filling out the contact form to email you, it'll block that. Jetpack, I just mentioned, allows you to create those contact forms, which allows you to obscure your email address, which itself is a good way to block spam. 
Also turns on a content delivery network for your images, so images load faster. You have more options about how images are displayed on your website. iTheme Security Pro is another freemium plugin. Actually, so is Jetpack. It blocks hackers and malware. I have found it very useful because my sites historically got hacked before I knew better. Updraft Plus is a freemium plugin for backing up your website. It can back up both the files, like your images that you upload, as well as your SQL database where all your content is stored, and put it on your Amazon S3, your Dropbox, another FTP server, download as a zip, whatever. Makes it very easy to back up your site and migrate as if you need to. Redirection allows you to create a URL that points somewhere else, kind of like I did with kdiveen.com slash retro mac os, which is not only handy for short URLs, but also if a page on your site, you decide to move it to a different address, this will send the old address to the new one. Open external links in new window is a podcasting plugin. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it opens external links in new windows. So it keeps, people, it keeps another tab on your browser that your site is in. And then when you, somebody goes somewhere else, it opens up a new tab. Uh, Smush and WP Featherlight are two image plugins. One, the first one compresses images so that they're small. So people accessing your website on mobile aren't eating up all their data. And Feather Light just allows images to open up in a nice shadow box or light box. Uh, and finally, post archival in the Internet Archive. As soon as you click publish on a blog post, it'll trigger the Wayback Machine and create a snapshot of that blog post in the Internet Archive, which is very handy. Uh, all of these plugins and more can be found at my list of favorite WordPress plugins, which is kgagging.com slash plugins, which is a 301 redirect. So you have the theme, you have the content, you have the publishing platform, you have the plugins. How do people find and stay on your website? Let's talk a little bit about discovery and retention. I took a look at my Google Analytics for my website to figure out where are people coming from? How are people finding my website, Apple 2 Bits? And it is mostly organic search. 58% of people coming to my website are just typing in words in Google and finding my website. They've never heard of my website before. They may never come back, but more than half of my traffic originates that way, at least. 26% are direct, which means they're either typing the URL into their address bar or they have it bookmarked. They're coming right to my site. 9% is social, which means I'm sharing my content on Twitter and Facebook, and hopefully other people are as well. And people are clicking on that link and coming to my website. 6% is referral, which means other websites are linking to mine. Uh, and 2% is email. So I'm emailing people about my website and they're coming by clicking on those links. Now I previously mentioned my five most popular posts. There's actually one page on my website that is more popular than any of those. Does anybody know what the most popular page on my website is? Any guesses? About me? People don't care about me. <laughs> if there's one thing that 39 years on this earth has taught me, it's that nobody cares about me. I care about you, Ken. Okay, so Sheppy. Sheppy cares. But uh, it's the home page. Just Apple2Bits.net. Not any particular blog post, but the home page. However, only 17% of all my traffic actually comes to the home page. That's like an eighth of all my traffic almost is going to the home page. Which means that most of my visitors never see the home page. If you have a website that has a different homepage layout or design than the individual articles, like most websites do nowadays, most visitors will never see that homepage. At my last day job, we were talking about, oh, let's put this big banner on the homepage that lets people know that our parking lot is closed due to construction. I'm like, great idea. 80% of people will never see it because they're going right to another page on the website from Google, from Facebook, whatever. If you want somebody to see something at my workplace, we had to put it on every page, a site-wide banner. <coughs> so it's important to have the home page because it is the most important, the most popular page, but proportionally, all your other pages are far more important. Which means it's important to get search engine optimization. Most people are going to those other sites. As I said, 58% are doing it through search. And SEO is how you optimize your website to make sure you show up high in the Google ranks. Most people don't click past the first page of Google search results. So if you're not in those top 10 hits, you're probably not going to get any traffic from Google. A good WordPress plugin to help you with that is Yoast SEO. It will help you optimize your website. It'll 
actually scan your content and give you like a green, yellow, or red light on how well it's likely to perform on Google. And you can take it to device and rewrite your content or add additional metadata that sites will pick up on. For example, it lets you write SEO descriptions. So this is a Google search result for one of my blog posts. And right there, there's a little summary. My dad, Edward F. Gagney, is the family's original gamer, as seen in this YouTube interview for Father's Day. Now that actual sentence doesn't show up in my blog post. If you click through to the website, you won't see that phrase. But it's something that I wrote specifically through Yoast to show up in Google. And now if somebody were to Google, for example, uh, Edward F. Gagney Gamer or uh, Gagney YouTube, you know, this has those keywords and is likely to show up high for those search terms. You can also write descriptions for social media optimization. <clears throat> Very similar to SEO, this is how your websites will look on Facebook and Twitter. So that same blog post shows up on Facebook like this. It has, I can write whatever I want up here, but then it also has a title, a little description, and a photo. Again, that photo does not actually show up on the blog post. If you click through the blog post, there's a YouTube video, but that photo is unique to Facebook because it's something that I added in Yoast to say, hey, when people link to my website on Facebook, this is the image you should tell Facebook to show. And it was an easy way to customize my links because links with photos get more clicks. Uh, let's see. Now, when you're playing in Twitter or Facebook and you gain links from that audience, you're playing somebody else's sandbox. We all know that Facebook and Twitter have algorithms and you're not gonna see everything so you want to establish a direct relationship with people, an unfiltered one that guarantees your message is going to get through to them. And for that, I recommend MailChimp. The most personal relationship you can have with your readership is through email, because that way you actually know who they are and how to contact them. Now, yes, there are spam filters, and we've had that problem for 30 years, but it's not an algorithm that says, oh, I'm going to show you your friend, this friend's post, but not this friend's post. If I'm your friend, you're going to get all my emails. Whether or not you read them is up to you, but that's a decision you make, not a decision Facebook is making for you. There are a lot of email service providers like MailChimp. Uh, Aweber comes highly recommended. Mad Mimi, a bunch of others. Uh, Constant Contact, for example. I like MailChimp because it has a free plan. There are paid versions, but for an Apple II website, I have found the free version to be great because it's good for up to 2,000 subscribers and up to 12,000 emails a month. So for example, if you have 2,000 subscribers, you can send six emails a month. If you have one subscriber, you can email them 12,000 times a month. And congratulations if they don't unsubscribe. Uh, also, this is what's called a lead gen opportunity. You are learning who your customers are directly. You're getting their email address. With Facebook and Twitter, you don't know who your readers actually are or how to get through that algorithm to contact them. But with MailChimp, you know exactly who they are and you can use that email address for something else if you want. In this case, you're gonna set up an RSS to email campaign, which means every time you write a blog post, you don't need to then copy and paste it into MailChimp. WordPress has a feature called RSS <clears throat> that is basically a feed of all your content. It can either be the first paragraph and then they have to click through to your website to read the rest, or it can be all your content, your choice. And whichever it is, you just connect that feature to MailChimp and MailChimp will take that content and email it to people. And then they can read it right in their email reader or they can click through to your website. So it's an RSS to email campaign, which you can then segment because when you ask people to sign up for your email list, you can ask for additional information, like what is your favorite model of Apple II? And then once you have that information, you can send them emails based on that. You can tell MailChimp, send every Wednesday's email to the 2GS readers and every Friday's email to the 2E readers, or something like that. So you can segment out your readership so that they're only getting this content that interests them. You can even segment it further to say, only send it to people who didn't open the last email. And you can send them the same email and say, hey, in case you missed it last week, here's what you missed, which is very nice for e-commerce. If you're doing a promotion 
and you're trying to sell something, you're saying, hey, this coupon, ex you send an email on Monday, this coupon expires on Friday. And by Friday, everybody who hasn't made a purchase yet, or who hasn't converted into a sale, you can send just those people another email saying, hey, the sale ends tonight. And all the people who did make the purchase aren't getting spammed to take advantage of an offer that they already took advantage of. Or if you do want to email them again, you can send them a separate email saying, hey, thanks for making your purchase. Remember, this is good for your friends too, so if you want to buy something for them or share the coupon with them, you have 24 more hours. So it's a great way to personalize your, inf your information. <coughs> MailChimp uh, has what's called an open rate. It can actually tell who opens the email in their inbox as opposed to just seeing the subject line and ignoring it or deleting it. Uh, in the computer and electronics industry, the average open rate in MailChimp is 19%. On my blog, it's 45%. Because this is not commercial email, this is people wanting to read this content. They specifically signed up to receive it. Also, the click rate. People who actually click a link in the email and go somewhere, whether it's back to my blog, a related resource that I mentioned, etc. Again, industry average is only 2%. Uh, Apple 2-bits, it's 5%. So I'm doing more than double in each of those categories, which means I have a very engaged audience. The click rate would probably be higher if I wasn't sending them all the content in the email. If I was just sending them the first paragraph and saying, to read the rest, go to my website. I'd probably get a higher click-through rate that way. But since my website doesn't have ads, I don't actually care if they come to the website or not. I'm happy for them to just be reading the content wherever they find most convenient. Similar to MailChimp was a service called FeedBurner. I, th I know Steve has used FeedBurner. I, uh, it's an ancient RSS enhancer. It adds more features to your RSS feed. It's now owned by Google. And this is worrisome because this is the same Google that killed Google Reader, which was a great RSS reader. So I now have in my head the idea that Google hates RSS. So why would they keep up with FeedBurner? FeedBurner is difficult to configure. It can result in multiple RSS feeds uh, that you are confusing your readers with which one to subscribe to. And you can always export your FeedBurner list into MailChimp. FeedBurner used to be how I would offer my subscribers an email option. Now I've taken all that information and put them into MailChimp. Ivan? To further support your theory, the Chrome browser is, I think, the only browser that has no native recognition of RSS at all. It just comes out as a, as a, as a plain text. Name. So Google Chrome is the only modern browser Ivan's aware of that no longer recognizes RSS. It just supports it as plain XML. So that supports the theory that Google hates RSS. So thank you. So I recommend not ever using FeedBurner. <laughs> you may have heard of it, stay away from it. If you're using it now, you can, it's not too late to migrate. <laughs> Another way to retain your audience once you get them on your website is to allow comments on your content. Allow them to engage with it. A kismet blocks most of the spam. I don't get a lot of hate. I don't think I've ever had to delete a comment from my Apple 2Bits website. Uh, the most popular blog posts in terms of comments are the best computer games from the 1980s. Everybody has a favorite computer game from the 1980s. They all want to let you know, or let me know, which one that is. Saving off burnout, which was about five years ago, I was like, I'm doing too many Apple II things. Kansas Fest, UCS, and Open Apple. I need to stop doing something. What should I stop doing? And I asked for people to let me know what I should stop doing. And a lot of people told me, you should stop doing this. <laughs> and I was like, thanks, I think. Uh, I wanted to get a license plate for my car that was inspired by the Apple II. And again, I asked for people's ideas. Uh, ultimately, I settled on the license plate Juiced, which was not available the year that this blog post went up, which was like six, seven years ago. Juiced became available last year, and it's now mine, and it's on my car. And it was only after getting the license plate and publishing Juiced GS for 11 years that I found out that Juiced is a metaphor for being on steroids. <laughs> I've gotten pulled over so many times. <laughs> Why didn't somebody tell me before? Thank you. Uh, the Apple II showed up on Pawn Stars. I wrote a blog post about that. That was very popular because people started leaving comments saying, how much could I get for my Apple II? And people started replying, you could get this much for your Apple II. Uh, the Art of the Crack, which I mentioned earlier. People love crack screens or just pirating, I guess. And the first game I ever played because everybody has a first game that they ever played. And they want to share their own memories. That's one of those personal memory stories I suggested you could write. 
So I've been doing this for about eight years. I want to briefly look at what sort of reception my blog has gotten over all that. Uh, what has it accomplished? Well, I've written 535 posts. Remember, it used to be twice a week. Now it's once a week. Uh, cumulatively, that is more than weekly over eight years. I've written 200,000 words, which I think is about 10 times longer than my uh, thesis. So I could write 10 theses and have 10 degrees or one Apple II blog. <laughs> I think that's a fair trade, right? Uh, the average length of each post is only 375 words. Sometimes if I'm embedding a YouTube video, I will let that do the talking for me. I might introduce it, provide some context and some original analysis, synthesis, and interpretation, but 375 words is not actually a lot. If you were writing a typed, double-spaced Microsoft Word document, that would be about a page and a half. So, not bad. My longest post was 2,000 words, and that was about staving off burnout. Surprisingly, I was so burnt out that I had 2,000 words to say about it. No wonder I was burnt out. Uh, I've gotten 556 comments, so that's at least, on average, one comment per post. Some posts get none, and then I have a post that gets dozens, so it varies. 180,000 page views. Now, I used to work at Computer World Magazine. They would get 9 million page views a month. That's a very different business, a very different economy. They have a huge publishing and marketing wing. I'm not selling anything. I don't need people to come to my website. So 180,000 page views on some scales isn't a lot. I'm very happy with it. I like it. And that comes from 100,000 different people. That's how many d unique users have been to my website in eight years. 100,000 people who, on some level, are interested in the Apple II. That's amazing. Imagine if they all came to Kansas Fest. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> now to put a few more chairs in here. <laughs> I want to share two specific examples of blog posts that I am really happy with the results of. One was, I never had this peripheral called the ALF music card, but you may be familiar with it from this advertisement that showed up in magazines, where somebody had modified an Apple II to have a guitar, and he's playing it. And I wrote a blog post, I'm like, I think this is a great ad. It reminds me of Guitar Hero, but 25 years before that game was ever invented. And, and who is that person in the ad? Well, I did some searching, and I think it's a guy named Bill Ficus. I don't know who Bill Ficus is, but I think that's who that is in the ad. Well, Google's a wonderful thing. I got a comment from Bill Ficus. <laughs> He's like, hey, I found your website, and I'm the guy in the ad. And every now and then, he still shows up on my blog just leaving comments. <laughs> and probably someday, I'm going to reach out to him and say, hey, I'd love to interview you for Juice GS about your Guitar Hero or whatever. But now I have his email address because he left a comment on my website. And I know how to reach the guy in the ad who I previously knew nothing about. Also, Randy Brandt. One year, I was driving from Boston to Denver and on the way, I stopped in western Massachusetts at the house of Thomas Compter, who has been to Kansas Fest. He was getting rid of boatloads of Apple II publications. And he said, hey, as long as you're going out to Denver and then to Kansas Fest, can you bring them to the garage giveaway? So I said, sure. Andy Malloy and I stopped at Thomas's house, picked up all these bins of magazines. While Andy was driving, I reached out behind the seat, grabbed a random issue, started flipping through it. I got the uh, NOG AppleWorks form. I was reading one of those. And I was like, oh, here's an article that I could write a blog post about. Like I said earlier, you read an old magazine, you write a blog post about an article. I'm like, here's an article I read by Randy Brandt, who, as we know, created various versions of AppleWorks and many other programs. Well, I then got an email uh, from, well, actually, no. So I made my trip to Denver, and I showed up there, and I found out that there was a local Apple users group. And so I wanted, I reached out to them and I said, hey, I'm in Denver for the summer and I know all about the Apple II. They said, would you like to come speak at Denver Apple Pie? I said, that'd be great. So I have that all set up. And then, again, Google is a fascinating thing. Somebody found my NOG AppleWorks form blog post. He emailed me and I said, hey, great to meet you. Where do you live? He's like, oh, I live in Denver. I was like, I'm in Denver. I'm coming to Denver Apple Pie. He's like, wow, I haven't been to Denver Apple Pie in 20 years. I'll come attend your talk. So I attended the talk, and so did Randy Brandt. I had written a blog post about him through Google. He had a Google alert set up for his name. He found my website. 
he came to Denver Apple Pie. So did Mike McGinnis, who lives in Denver. They established a friendship. They kept, Mike was evangelizing Kansas Fest. And a year later, Randy Brandt was the keynote speaker at Kansas Fest and received the Apple II Forever Award because he had a Google alert set up to find my blog post. And I was in Denver. And I, it's bizarre. But if I hadn't reached behind the seat and grabbed that issue of Nog, if I hadn't read that article by Randy Brandt, if I hadn't published a blog post that had his name in it, all these other connections would not have happened. You know, and obviously, mad props to Mike McGinnis for making the other connections and bringing him here, because they both live in Denver and they were able to carpool. But you never know who's going to read your website, who is going to stumble across your blog. So I encourage you to have to discover what your story is about the Apple II and to share it online. Set up a blog, post some photos, uh, embed a YouTube video, get some keywords out there that will show up in Google, and share it. I, again, have a handout at kgagging.com slash kfest2018. One page is the idea generation exercise that I mentioned I experienced at Emerson College. You don't need to pay $30,000 for a master's degree. This handout is free and is distributed with the permission of the instructor who devised it. And the other page is links to all the resources I mentioned regarding WordPress, MailChimp, etc. cetera. Uh, any questions about blogging about the Apple II? Mark. Is the search engine optimization software Yoast a plugin to WordPress? <coughs> Yoast is a plugin to WordPress. Okay. There, there are other SEO plugins for WordPress. One is called SEO Framework. Another one is called All-in-One SEO Pack. Your mileage may vary. Some people find Yoast to be bloated, but it is the one officially recommended by my employer, WordPress.com. So the, the m WordPress itself, as a piece of software, does 80% of the SEO right out of the box. For the last 15 to 20%, you'll need a plugin. And that's all up to editorial decisions. WordPress, as a piece of software, can't make you write content that has keywords in the right spots. Yoast helps you do that. So. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Charles. Have you written any of your Apple II blog posts on an Apple II? And if so, how did you workflow that from that into WordPress? Have I written any of my blog posts on an Apple II? And how did I workflow it to get back onto the Apple II? So I have not written my blog post on an Apple II, unfortunately. I wrote stories about the Apple II for computerworld.com on an Apple II. And that actually got mentioned in the footer of the story. Like, hey, uh, BTW, this is written on Apple II. Just be a little meta about that. Uh, what I tend to use instead and somehow I forgot to put this in my slides, was a program called MarsEdit. I use MarsEdit, whoa, hi, on the Mac. Oh, gosh. Uh, I know I'm almost out of time. I have like one minute left. Let me turn off mirroring here, which should help with the display. And, or turn on mirroring, rather. There we go. That's even worse. Great. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, this is Mars Edit. It allows, it connects to your WordPress blog and allows you to download all the content that's on there and edit it. So it's a local offline Mac client for WordPress and other CMSs. Uh, you can uh, save offline drafts. So this is a whole list of all the Apple II Bits blog posts that I haven't written yet. But like I found a website, I was like, oh, I should go back to that website and write a blog post about it. So I saved the link. In my local drafts folder, I file it under Apple II bits because I have a lot of blogs, as you can see. And whenever I need something to write about, I just open up one of those. I'm like, oh, I'm glad I saved this. I can write about it later. And it also lets you see what your blog post will actually look like when it is published. So on the left there is my draft about Richard Garriott on the moth. And on the right is what it'll look like when it goes up on my website. So I have a local template that dynamically updates as I'm updating on the left. Kind of like in the old days with Dreamweaver, you'd have the raw HTML on the left and the process HTML on the right. This is similar. Uh, so MarsEdit is the program that I use for composing most of my stuff. I then upload it into WordPress and make my final tweaks there before I click publish. If anybody else has any other questions, you're welcome to hit me up on email. 
uh, on my blog at apple2bits.net. There's a contact form there. Or at Kansas Fest. Thank you so much. We have about a 10 minute break until the next session, so take advantage. Specifically ask you about the history and see whether or not you want to dive into that. I'd be ha happy to talk about that. I'm going to turn this off. There we go. Thank you. That was good. So I, I have a question I'd like to ask you that is a kismet. Yes. If you use it on more than one thing, you get charged money. You have to pay them. You don't have to. I use a kismet on all my blogs for free. Well, it seems like I had thought when you added it to more than one, they started saying, well, you have to pay us more than one. It's, it may not be intuitive, but there is a free option. Oh, yeah. so. Thank you. I had a present for you. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, enjoy. Thank you. I used to play this exact <laughs> copy when I was a kid. Right. Thank you. Or not this copy, but this issue. Uh, Microzine. Hi, Quinn. Hey. Um, how do you integrate with Google Analytics? The SEO plugin I use also supports Google Analytics. So it just has a little field where you punch in your tracking code, UA dash something. Which one I use control on my blog. I mean, there are plugins just for Google Analytics, and I can recommend those. But I actually don't use Yoast. I use all-in-one SEO pack because it does SEO, it does Google Analytics, it does social media optimization, and it does XML sitemaps. So I do all that in one plugin. Yeah, I did that. I stuck it in the header. Oh, I think I installed it. <laughs> yes, that exists. The downside to modifying the header file directly is if you upgrade your theme, it gets overwritten. And then you have to create a child theme to prevent that from happening. Which I did. And it gets complicated. Yeah, it's like a Yes, I'll email you a link. Ivan? Um, in case you do not know, www.juice.gs supposed to just plain old juice.gs look at some quick endless redirection. My phone didn't like it. For what? Alright, I'll get back. Just before the release, I made this document. Right. Oh, I don't Weird though. Maybe I was in a deeper URL and didn't realize it. Oh, it seems I've, I'm trying both SSL and non SSL. I'm seeing it load. Secondly, on a mobile device, unless you wrote, or at least my mobile device, if you don't wrote, it's, if you don't rotate, there's no nav. There's no header. There's no nav. On what website? Just yes. Yeah. It's probably at the bottom. Really? Well, there's the nav. Where? About, index, cover gallery, newsletter. Oh, that's the nav. Yeah, it matches. It doesn't look like a nav. It matches what's here. If it, it does, if, you're right. And if you tap index, it should be a drop down. Well, it is. Or isn't. maybe not. Maybe that's why I didn't so realize it was. I would like to oh. redesign this website. I understand. Also, the index pages aren't actually. Well, that doesn't look. Oh. The index actually is not responsive. No, forget that it's not. You're right, correct. And in fact, you can't read it on some of the pages. Like yeah. when you go into an issue, it's off the oh, side. Okay. I, I personally don't use mobile a lot, but that doesn't mean that I should ignore people who do. I don't. I'm doing it increasingly because this phone is so good at it. I was never really a mobile web guy until I got the 10, and now I am. Yeah. Bye. See ya. Can I, can I get out of your way? Oh, you're, that's okay. You're setting up next, I presume. I am. Already? You presume correct. This is the original. This is just one comment about like, your mail open and Uh huh. So, as far as I'm aware, mail open is determined by a tracking device. Yeah, a pixel. Yeah. And most people do not find the 2018 fault to not go on their images. Depends on the program. I found that to be true in Outlook. 
uh, Apple Mail, in my experience, don't respond to people. But also where I'm going is, if you're putting whole blog posts and messages with media, people are going to trust your emails. That's right. So that's actually going to skew your metrics up relative to everyone else's artificial low metrics. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so you thought it might mean that my metrics are higher than I realized, because I don't always have good metrics. This, this is, well, what I mean is, people who are subscribing to your emails are likely going to trust this sender. So, however, some, I mean, this is. It, it is also that there may be these click to show me the if you're not going to see those. Now, this is tangentially your point, but when I embed YouTube videos, they will need to have a Hey, Steve. So, um. For some reason, it is beyond, it's beyond my mind's understanding. We cannot do both sound from the computer through the, through the amplifier and microphone through the okay. amplifier. You plug them both in, and the, this, the, the microphone goes away. If you have sound that you want to do for this, all we have to do is hold the other mic up. Okay, sounds good. There's no sound. Okay. CPM didn't have sound. <laughs> oh, CPM had no sound. What? Yeah. <laughs> I did actually do a teeny bit of CPM back in the day on a North Star Horizon. Oh my you know, gosh. And so I have that little bit of familiarity. Little bit of familiarity. Just, just enough to remember that I used it, and that's about it. Well, hopefully this will enlighten a little bit today. I, there is so much available on CPM that it is. I was told, uh, and maybe you know, maybe you know this, I was yeah. told that at one time the largest base of CPM users was the Apple II. Yeah, it is. Because of the Z80 card. Because of the Z80 card. I'm going to actually talk about that a little bit here. Right. Yeah. At least it's nice to know one of my pieces of information wasn't wrong. Wasn't wrong, yeah. Here's your microphone. All right. And uh, when you switch it on, mm -hmm. you flip it to on, it'll briefly light up, but then the light goes away. It doesn't mean it's not working. It okay. just means that, I don't know why it does that, but that's All right. what it does. We'll do that. Yep, give me a... Yep, give me a few secs to set up here. No, I'm 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 gonna do it all from an emulator. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do it all from an emulator. 
I found that laying out last night. Was just on the table. Oh, I don't know if that was something. Thanks. You bet. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, this is much better as far as not having the feedback and stuff like that than the other thing was. But the problem is you come up with this and you can't play, you can't put both the resources through widely. You have to work. Both sides have to check. What is the problem? I mean, I know what is the problem. What is the problem? All right. Okay, welcome to the next session. We have the other microprocessor for the Apple II, and we have our speaker, Jay Graham. Take it away, Jay. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> so, what I want to talk a little bit about this morning is the second microprocessor for the Apple II. Um, turn this and put this a little bit further away. <laughs> Okay, yeah, because probably don't even need a mic. But um, <laughs> so, as you all probably know, there were a lot of processor boards and coprocessor boards that were made for the Apple II. Um, there was the Stellation Mill, which was a 6809. There was a 68000. Um, the most popular one, though, was the Microsoft Soft Card, which spawned a whole bunch of Z80. Um, lookalikes, clones, and, you know, ones from different manufacturers. So what I wanted to talk a little bit about this morning was a brief history of the Z80, a brief history of CPM, how CPM came into being, the Apple CPM card solutions that are available and that are of past and present, believe it or not, there are people, you know, building uh, clones and knockoffs of them now. What, where, where you can get a vast array of CPM software and talk a little bit about that. And then at the end, if there's time, we'll do a quick demo on the emulator here. So where, where did the, C8, the Z80 CPU come from? Um, one of my pet peeves, I just wanted to sidetrack here for a minute, is audiobooks. When you're reading technical audiobooks or listening to them in the car, um, the one thing that really kills me is when people butcher names of, uh, and, don't, and acronyms and so forth. So the inventor of the, CP, or the Z80 CPU is Federico Fagin, and you can imagine how the audiobooks butcher <laughs> that name with the spelling there. So, um, and honest to God, they did when you, when you talk about it. So, um, so Again, the Z80, um, Federico actually worked at Intel, and he worked on the design of the 4004, which was the first Intel microprocessor, and the 8080, which uh, we all know was in the uh, mids Altair, and you know that, that was kind of the processor that started it all for them. Well, he left um, Intel. <coughs> and with a gentleman by the name of Ralph Ungerman from Ungerman Bass, who as we heard later on with networking, they, um, they basically developed the, the Z80 and started conceiving this as a processor in late 1974. And it was an extension of the 8080, so it was basically binary compatible with the 8080. It was aimed for embedded systems, although it had a completely different use in the end than, than what they envisioned early on. So they made a whole set of peripheral chips with, with it, um, and they, were, they wanted to use it in various embedded systems. And, and it did see use there, but it saw its largest use in the microcomputer industry. It was officially introduced in July of uh, 1976, so right for the bicentennial, and it basically came into wide use in the microcomputers, and everybody picked this up, and it actually was pretty big in video games back in the 70s and 80s. It was a processor that was used there, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, Zilog was the company that made it. They licensed manufacturing to Cinertech and Mostech, who everybody knows Mostech from the uh, 6502. And it basically improved over the 8080 and the 8085 by enhancing the instruction set 
it had a better interrupt system and less hardware was required to implement it. It actually used a single plus five volt power supply. It didn't need multiple voltages like some of the other, other processors did and it, the clock in the I.O. was real easy um, to implement on that. This is, um, I'm not going to get into the assembly language and, or in any detail today because I have 45 minutes, so um, and there's a bunch you can learn about this just by Googling it online. I'll make this presentation available online and I have some URLs at the end um, that can guide you to different places. But the Z80 basically it paired 8-bit registers. Um, to, you know, basically to, to generate 16-bit registers and 16-bit versions of the registers um, in there. It actually had a unique feature where it was the fetch execute overlapping, it was called. So it could actually be executing one instruction while it was fetching the next. So the kind of the old day version of Spectre and Meltdown. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, so, so it, uh, you know, it, it had, the, it had a, um, you know, it had a unique feature for, for doing that. It also had its own set of undocumented opcodes, illegal opcodes, and bugs in it as well. Um, there were roughly 252 opcodes, and this is kind of what the register structure looks like. For anybody that wants to see what the silicon, or silicon looks like, this is a um, version of the um, the Z80 and what the design of it looks like. Interestingly enough, ROM Magazine, which was an old magazine back in the day, they had a centerfold in the magazine, like R2-D2 <laughs> was the centerfold. The Z80 was actually the centerfold in one of the ROM magazines. This picture right here, somebody has it. So, so I actually have that and I have it framed at home and I have the Z80 on the wall with the, uh, with the centerfold um, with that. So here are um, two people that we, we should know for the Apple II. The one on the right, we, I think we all know, that was, that's Chuck Peddle. He was the actual um, you know, designer of the 6502. And that's you know, when Wozniak wandered up to the suite in the West Coast Computer Fair, plopped down his 20 bucks, got the 6502 instead of implementing it with the 6800 which was about 300 bucks back then, and the rest is history. And the guy on the left is actually Federico Fagin, and he was heavily involved in the chip design. It was in interesting, because he was the CEO of the company, but he was working like 80-hour weeks to, um, to actually get, and with, along with two other designers, to actually get the design done for the Z80 in order to meet the schedule that, uh, you know, that, that they, they, they put out. This is what the package looks like um, in the DIP40 configuration. Um, believe it or not, there are variants of the Z80 that are still around today, and it's, you probably can find it in every package known to man for a surface mount. And, and, but this was the, the DIP40 that we would see on all of, the, um, all of the various cards for the Apple II. And there's a side-by-side -side comparison of the Z80 and the 6502. And here are some of the vendors that actually utilized the, the Z80 back then. Um, Coleco used it. Xerox obviously used it in their 820. Heathkit. Um, Timex Sinclair. Everybody knows the Sinclair ZX80 and ZX81. That, that used it. Um, obviously Radio Shack with the TRS-80 back then. MSI. K-Pro and Osborne with their Lovables actually used the Z80 processor, MITS, Commodore. Um, interestingly enough, the, if anybody remembers the old NEC V20 and V30 chips, which were MS-DOS um, uh, uh, chips that actually ran MS-DOS, they did have an emulation mode that would allow you to run the CPM86 version. And the other one, does anybody know um, that logo? For, that I have the arrow pointing to? Somebody does in the back. BBC Micro. Yes, BBC Micro. Come listen to my talk tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, I, I, I really like the logo. So, um, when, when, when I, so I put the logo up there, but they actually used a Z80 processor. And there, there's a picture of it right there. 
Um, and the interesting thing, I don't have time today, but Acorn Computers was the design of that. And okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. So um, yeah. So everybody knows Acorn from the ARM, which is used in a lot of these devices today. And ARM actually stands for Acorn Risk Machine. So they got into the risk business, and that in and of itself, you could do a Kansas Fest. Um, uh, although it doesn't have to do with the Apple except for the iPhone and that, but you, there, it, there is an interesting story there and I highly recommend that you go Google that and read that or talk to the <laughs> gentleman in the back there, the Acorn Risk Machine. So, um, interesting story. What's that? Z80. Z80, yes. The Z80. So, yeah, yep, that's true. So let's talk a little bit about the CPM history then. We, um, that's kind of, well, again, there's tons out there on the Z Z80, so you can Google it and you can read everything from where, where it came from to where it is today. And so along parallel with that, there was a gentleman who was um, designing and, and developing CPM. So CPM stood for Control Program and Monitor initially, but then later was changed to Control Program for Microcomputers. It was created, obviously, for the Intel 8080 and the 8085 by a gentleman named Gary Kildall, who we all might know <laughs> and have seen, so I'll talk a little bit about him. It was a single-tasking 64K of RAM, 8-bit operating system, MITS Altair, um, was uh, probably one of the first, you know, the, to, to use it. And as we all know, the story, how it was displaced by MS-DOS in the early 80s, and I'll talk a little bit about that later when we talk about Gary Kildall. So here's Gary Kildall, born in Seattle, Washington. And he attended the University of Washington, and he was pursuing a degree in mathematics. He worked as a consultant, actually, for Intel as well. So he worked on the 4004, um, roughly about the same time that Federico was there and developed the first high-level programming language, which was called PLM, and he used actually PLM to write CPM. <laughs> so he, he demoed this CPM for Intel and said, hey, look, I have this operating system. Um, do you guys want to, you know, want to want to do anything with it? And they basically had, no, we don't, we don't really have any interest in this. And the reason for that is because Gordon Moore at the time from Intel they were in the processor business. They really weren't in the PC business. So when people were developing the PCs, which needed these operating systems, Gordon Moore was always flipping out about that and saying, no, we want to sell the processors so that our customers can build the PCs, but we don't want to build PCs ourselves. So he formed a company called Intergalactic Digital Research. <laughs> And late, later on, they renamed it and filed for a name change for digi just digital research, and they dropped off the intergalactic. And by 1982, it was interesting because CPM was running over 3,000 different hardware platforms. So it is probably the most ubiquitous um, operating system around. Apple, the Apple II was one of them. And yay. <laughs> And of course, everybody knows the PC DOS story when uh, Gary went flying, as Bill Gates called it. Um, Gary was on a business trip that day when IBM came to the door, and his wife and business partner, um, Dorothy McEwen, and she didn't take his last name because she didn't want to be associated with Gary Kildall and wanted to, you know, um, you know, be on be on it on her own and not not be associated with the CPM and um, and the operating system. So she would not sign the non-disclosure agreement that IBM basically, and there's variations of this story, and since some of this probably folklore at this point, but basically um, didn't sign the disclosure. Eventually they talked, and Gary wanted to say, they, IBM wanted to buy CPM outright for, <coughs> for a disclosed sum. Gary said, no, I want royalties when it sells with every you know, PC, I'd like a royalty, and IBM said no. Well, then they went to Bill Gates, and Bill Gates said, I'd like royalty with everyone that is sold, and they said yes to him when, you know, they, when they went to DOS. So it's like, okay. <laughs> then later on in life, um, 
with, with what Gary did was he came up with a graphical interface called GEM. And that was a digital research product and found himself getting in trouble with Apple with that one. Um, so much to the fact that on the Apple II, they actually had to remove the trash can icon from the, the GEM operating system. Although the Atari, they were able to keep it on there because Apple didn't think Atari was going to, you know, compete with them, so they didn't, uh, they didn't, you know, have have uh, the Atari actually remove the trash can. And actually, there were multi multi window, so it was a multi windowed operating system. And on the Apple, they had to make it so that it only opened up, um, you know, two windows. Um, he also hosted a show that we probably have all watched, Computer Chronicles, with Stuart Chaffee. He was on that for many years. And then, as we may or may not know, Novell acquired DRI, or Digital Research, in 1981, and that's where he pretty much made his millions <laughs> when, when they acquired that, and then died mysteriously in 1994. And again, a lot, of, uh, a lot of folklore and things out there on how he passed away. So, as I said, it was developed in 1974. There was a large library of software out there. And actually, a lot of the interesting features that were in MS-DOS actually were born in CPM. So drive letters, CPM used A colon and B colon, just like DOS did. They um, pioneered the 8.3 file name, so eight characters and a three-character extension. The wildcards were actually in CPM. Device names, like PRN for printer and CON for console and control Z, which was essentially the end of the f end of file. And there are others, but those are the major ones. So when they originally developed CPM in 1974, and we, when he went to Intel, this was a prototype box that Intel had. And they were interfacing this with a Shugart 8-inch floppy drive. And Gary developed CPM for this. And again, they didn't really call this a computer. It was an Intel development environment. Um, so this is essentially when they, when he talked to Intel, what they, uh, you know, what they said, ah, now nah, we really don't see a use for the C for CPM. So some of the commercial software titles that are available for the, at the time, Microsoft essentially, and we'll get to the card, the, the soft card in a minute, but and I'll tell you why they wanted to develop that. But Microsoft ha had a lot of languages out there that were written for C in, in CPM, COBOL, Fortran. Aztec C, which is a big C compiler. Of course, Borland had pa Turbo Pascal and Modula 2. There was actually an Ada compiler, a MUMPS uh, uh, compiler and interpreter, if anybody knows what that is. And there were various basic versions that came out, the MBASIC from Microsoft and then the CBASIC from Gordon Eubanks um, back then, who, who was working with Gary Kildall. Word processors, there was WordStar, Tex, TeaMaker and Magic Wand word processor, believe it or not. That's not a well-known one, but WordStar we've probably all used. Um, databases, DBase2, and What's It? And I don't know if anybody knows the story of What's It, but that's another interesting one to Google. That's actually an acronym of, wow, how did all that stuff get in there? <laughs> And actually, it was a free-form database back then, which was kind of uh, innovative for 1975 when they developed this. So it was kind of like the Hadoop of the 70s, because it was a free-form database. And basically, the story is that there was a gentleman um, the, uh, who, um, Lyle Morrell from Computer Headware Software that designed this, went to the 1978 West Coast Computer Fair with Sharpie sign signs handwritten disk labels, and he was selling this software. And his booth didn't look really professional, but lo and behold, next door, he was by, uh, with IBM with three men in pinstripe suits, all of the you know gold and silver rails and signs and all of that there. And those three gentlemen in the suits stood around all day watching hundreds and thousands of people come to this guy's booth and buy this What's It software. Um, and, you know, they didn't even have a cash drawer, the story goes, and, you know, he had cash all over the table um, because people were just buying up, buying up this piece of software. And actually, it ran on the Apple II. Uh, business software, Microsoft Multiplan and SuperCalc, we all know what those are. And games, believe it or not, there were games for CPM. They weren't, uh, 
They weren't graphical um, in, in nature, but Nemesis was a Dungeons and Dragons game. Sargon Chess was actually um, developed on CPM before it went to all of the millions of other platforms. Zork 1, 2, and 3, and then there were norm numerous basic games that were available. So this is actually what the Sargon 2 chess game looked like. It was text-based, and then you used Escape to view the board. So on the Apple II, you could actually view the graphics on the board. Some of the other ones, um, which I think it was it was the Wavetronics or something, Jupiter 3, which was the first computer that was on, didn't have any graphics, so there was only a, a um, you know, a, a, a um, text version of it. So there are three components to CPM. There's the BIOS, the BDOS, and the CCP. And everybody probably has heard the word BIOS, Basic Input Output System. And BDOS was the basic disk operating system, and CCP was the console command processor. Now, the unique feature in why CPM was ported to so many hardware platforms is that essentially the BDOS and the CCP was the same. That was written at a higher level. Um, and, you know, we, we hear about it today. It's called, like, the hardware abstraction layer and how... Um, so that was written at a lot higher level, and the BIOS was the low-level glue that tied that high level together with the actual hardware itself. So when you ported it to a new platform, you really had to only rewrite the BIOS because the, the BDOS and the CCP were, were, were essentially, you know, unchanged on that. Um, the, the console command processor was responsible for interpreting the commands and actually taking actions on it. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. There were intrinsic commands that were in CPM, and then there were external ones. Intrinsic ones were part of the operating system. Um, when the operating system booted up, didn't have to go to disk to run a program where the external ones it, it did. There was, it also came with an interesting debugging tool called DDT, the dynamic debugging tool, but it was also like the big jokes were going around with the pesticide and so forth back then, the bug killer. So it actually was a pretty full-featured one in CPM back then. I mean, we have a lot better ones today, but for what you got back then, you could actually debug programs and so forth, single step through them. Um, so there was, there was some interesting things there as well. So the first public version of CPM was version 1.4, and there was a version 2.2 and a 3.0. Apple had some unique versions, uh, CPAM 4.0 and 5.1, A standing for Applied Engineering. So I don't know whether that was control program for Applied Engineering outfitted microcomputers or something like that, but they, they decided to put the A in there um, on their version. And it actually, some of the versions that, um, had ProDOS support, so you could actually, and I'll talk a little bit if there's time at the end, how you could um, actually develop or, or format a ProDOS partition and actually run CPM from ProDOS. Um, the versions got better as, as they went along. Um, version 3 and the, uh, the CPAM versions, which I'll demo those at the end here, probably were the most full featured. Now let's talk a little bit about the CPM and the DOS command comparisons. So um, the stars or the asterisks on here are the ones that denote the intrinsic commands. So those are the ones that are internal to the operating system. So DIR is pretty much the way it worked in DOS, DIR, drive letter, and then the file spec, and you could use the wild cards of asterisk and question mark, asterisk representing a string of characters, question mark representing a single character, wild card. The type command was in both of them, and it was basically type in a file spec. CPM had ed, which was a fantastic state-of-the-art line editor. <laughs> Um, it I, and had its own set of cryptic commands, and of course DOS, we all know, had Edlin. Uh, erase was the, um, the command on CPM to get rid of a file. could be abbreviated with three letters, ERA, um, and, the, um, you know, and, and you gave it a file spec, and DEL was the, the DOS version of it. And if you wanted to confirm, you had basically put the word confirm after the erase command, and it would ask, do you really want to delete it, where, you know, in the later versions of DOS, you did the slash Y. So pretty much 
you know, it makes sense up to that point. Now we get to the one which is the copy command. And CPM had a program called PIP, Peripheral Interchange Program. Came back from the old days of RTS-11 and RT OS-08 from the DEC-10s. There, there was a command on there. And it did a little bit more than the copy command did, but it's kind of like the copy command because that's what you use to move files from different disks. Um, you could print to the printer from it. You could use you know, console devices and so forth. And then you have the copy command in DOS. Does anybody see something unique about those two commands? Oh. Yeah. A, B, ass backwards. So, <laughs> so this killed me when I was going from CPM to DOS. I can't tell you how many times I overwrote files. Um, with PIP, the destination went first and the source came second. So PIP a colon equals B colon star dot star. That moved files from the B drive to the A drive. Copy A colon uh, space B colon star dot star did it exactly the opposite in DOS. So that, and it still confuses me to this day because I, I had one of these soft cards from the, my Apple II when I got it and uh, it Still, it, you know, I still got to think when I'm ever issuing a copy command at the command line. Thank God for drag and drop. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, because, yeah, what's that? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Thank God for drag and drop. So, rename, there was a rename in the ren command. Um, again, most of the CPM commands could be abbreviated to the first three letters, so that was about the same. There was kind of a rudimentary batch file processing in CPM, it was called submit. The file had to end in a dot sub extension, but you could put CPM commands in there and do submit, space, and then the file name. And it would execute the CPM commands in order. Um, obviously today we know that in DOS, you know, batch files, you put the commands or you know, there's bat, a dot bat or a dot CMD file. Now the interesting thing about CPM is that there was no subdirectories, uh, uh, kinda. <laughs> Um, so in, in MS-DOS, you know, and in Windows and so forth, we create folders and subdirectories all the time and don't give it a thought. Well, in CPM, there wasn't such a thing. There was no way to create subdirectories, but there was a user command. And what the user command did, the N or, uh, after that, was a number from 0 to 15. And user 0 was kind of the master user. That was the master user of the file system. So if I walked up to a CPM machine and I did user space one and then did a DIR, I would see all of the files that were in the user zero section of the file system. However, if I created any files in, in Ed, Ed or Edlin or, or I'm sorry, Ed or you know, any of the software and I saved it to the diskette or the disk at that point, I would be the only one that would see the files in user one. So I'd have to do user space one, and then I would see the files that I created. If I do user space zero, and went back to the master file system and did a DIR, wouldn't see those files. Now, there was there a password on it? No. I mean, somebody could walk up and do user one, and then they would be able to see my files. But the interesting thing is that a lot of the commands, and I left it out for brevity here, a lot of the commands had a GN after it, where if I wanted to, if I was in user area two, and I wanted to copy a file from user area one, I could put a parameter on the pip command that would actually say, please look for this file, not only on drive A, but in user area one. So it was kind of a poor man's, uh, you know, subdirectory structure. And then stat was the command that would actually check the disk at that point. It wasn't as full feature as check disk was, so it didn't look for bad sectors or any of that type of thing. But it was, nonetheless was a, uh, was, a, um, was a command. So that brings us to why the Apple II. Well, that was one of Paul Allen's idea at Microsoft. And again, remember what I said earlier, Microsoft went out and wrote all of these programming languages for the CPM systems like the MITS Altair and so forth, and they wrote them all in CPM. And they said, gee, 
we should make it easy to port these to the Apple. You know, the Apple, there's thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of Apple users out there. We should make, we should make all of this CPM software available to them. So he had the idea, and it, the card itself was developed by Tim Patterson, yes, from Seattle Computer Products, guy, the DOS guy, and Bill Gates. And actually, it was manufactured and redesigned um, from a, for, a, by another company, Bertrox or Bertronix or something like that. Um, Don Burtis was it was a guy that redeveloped it. He was an engineer and redeveloped the card. And again, you know, as I said, it was trying to simplify the porting of Microsoft's languages. And it was demonstrated at the West Coast Computer Fair in 1980. And Steve and I were talking about it right before the the break. This was the cash cow for Microsoft back then. This is what brought all of their revenue in. Um, and you, the card went, it was Microsoft Soft Card, went for $349 back then. You plugged it into your Apple II, and I did a calculation in 2018 dollars, and that's like $1,000, um, you know, in, in 2018 dollars. And it essentially made the Apple II the most widely used CPM platform around. <laughs> Blowing, blowing all of the other ones away. Now, uh, let's talk about some of the options for the Apple II. Obviously, this was the first option that was available. It was the good old Microsoft soft card when it came out. Microsoft could not keep up with the demand for these things and, and um, because everybody saw them. Um, although they demoed it at the West Coast Computer Fair, they basically took business cards because they, they didn't have the product at that time and they didn't realize. It was one of those things where they didn't really realize how, how popular this was going to be. Um, so there are essentially two types of these cards. One of them is the soft card style and this basically suspends the 6502 via a DMA line and takes over the bus of the Apple II at, at that point and it has direct access to all of the Apple II hardware. The other, and some of the examples of this are obviously the Microsoft Soft Card, the Applied Engineering Z80 um, Plus, which I actually have one in a box here, and then Ian Kim's Turbo 7, which is a soft card clone. That's kind of a modern day soft card clone of the Z80. Um, you can tell by the CLPD that's in there. The second type of card that was available, which was the single board, single board computer. Um, so what this was, this functioned independently of the 6502. They typically had onboard RAM, 64K. Some of them had 64K and a 64K um, expansion on it. And it's interesting because a lot of these boards, when you weren't using the Z80 processor, you could use the extra RAM on there as a RAM disk. A lot of the companies wrote drivers so that you could use, use that as a RAM disk when you weren't using the Z80. Um, the Z80s on the soft card model were clocked relatively low. They were, you know, the one megahertz and so forth. On the single board computers, they developed and clocked these babies at anywhere from four to six megahertz, was like, which was like flying back then. The drawback is they really had no direct access to the Apple hardware. The drivers had to be written for everything. And they typically plugged in the auxiliary slot of the Apple IIe, and there were some that were made for the normal slot. Some examples of these are the Personal Computer Peripherals Inc. Applicard, and the Applicard, um, in my opinion, that is kind of the Cadillac of the CPM. It was, it was expensive back then, but that's the Cadillac of the, of the CPM cards for the Apple. Um, and I, I have a few of them here, and I can, anybody that wants to stop by later, I can, you know, show them the software and so forth for that. But that one was, was kind of the Cadillac. Um, and interestingly enough, there were, there were three different versions of this card made, although they were really the same. One of them was the one that actually that PCPI sold to the users with the CPM software. And uh, the other one was called the Star Card. And it was the same card. It was just bundled with WordStar and I think it was you know, SpellStar or one of those things. So it was the same card. So good old Seymour Rubenstein, who <laughs> de developed WordStar, decided you know we could sell more WordStar if we partnered with this company and and uh, and um, and sold our WordStar and SpellStar along with this. The other one was Franklin Computer actually came to them and said we would like a version of this for the Franklin. Again, it was the same. 
um, you know, same card, but it, but it sported the Franklin logo on it. Then Microsoft, with the success of the original soft card, came out with a soft card 2E. This card plugged into the auxiliary slot on the Apple IIe. It did the 80 column, you know, card and, you know, and, and has some RAM on it as well and did the, um, you know, did the CPM as, as well on that. This card, I don't know if anybody's ever seen one. I have one here and I'll show you. It is a huge card. It is long and it is tall. So if you did what I did and you take an Apple II Platinum uh, motherboard and you stick it in an Apple, original Apple II case like I did, this soft card 2E will not fit. There is no way to wedge it in there because the, the, apparently you know, the Platinum case might have been a, just an inch longer or a half inch longer on there. So I can't get my, platinum, or my soft card 2E in my, in my Frankenstein Apple II there. The um, and Advanced Lo Logic Systems was another another company that made a, a pretty uh, pretty robust CPM card and called it the CPM card. Very creative there, and again it had RAM on, RAM on board as well. But that that was one that fit in a regular slot. The the only one on this picture that fit in the auxiliary slot was the the Microsoft card. The other ones were uh, were, were you know fat, uh, fit in a regular regular slot. Not to leave out the good old Apple IIc, there were uh, th uh, three options available that I know of for the Apple IIc. There might have been more. Two of them were by Applied Engineering, and one of them was from a company called Surtech. I didn't put a picture of that one up there because by far these are the most popular. Um, my Apple IIc up here has one of the ZRAM Ultra 3s in it, which gave you RAM, CP, uh, or CPM, is a Z80 to run CPM, and a clock and calendar um, with a battery on it. Um, that in the Apple IIc really made a kick butt Apple IIc. Um, and the other nice thing on that card is that they, uh, Applied Engineering also um, sold the, uh, the, the 68 uh, or 65812 process upgrade on there. And I actually have that in there. So I'm running a, that, that processor in there instead of the 6502. Um, Applied Engineering also just made a Z80 card that fit in the Apple IIc. Um, one side note, I can tell you the ZRAM Ultra 3, when I took my Apple IIc apart to clean it and had to put that back in, that is not an easy board to install in the Apple II. Um, you have to remove the 6502 off the motherboard and then there's a socket on the bottom of this board that you cannot see because it spreads the whole length of the keyboard and you have to get that seated exactly right in there. Then the 6502, um, you know, or the processor upgrade fits in the um, fits in the uh, fit, fits on a socket on the motherboard, and, and like I said, I have the the 65816 in there. So, how do we get started on the Apple with CPM? Well, there's a, there's a couple of things that we we do here. One of them is you want to choose your hardware. What um, the actual Apple Win actually emulates the CPM card, and I'll, when I do the demo here, I'll actually, you know, we'll actually use that instead of using the real hardware. If you want to see the real hardware run later, that's great. There is a drawback of using the emulator, though. CPM is very driver dependent, and a lot of the things that you want to do, that BIOS section, um, like for example, most of the CPM versions support the Unidisc. Um, and you have to load a driver within the, within the CPM operating system itself to support the Unidisc, but it will support the three and a half Unidisc, and they actually called that mass storage back then. So, um, one of the other interesting things about the Apple II is you have to get the correct version of CPU for the card that you're running. Um, some of them will run across the different hardware platforms. Some of them will not. For example, the, the CPAM will not run on the Z80 soft card. Could not get it to work. It'll, it'll error out on it. Um, so there are, there are subtle differences in the versions of the operating system that you know, actually take advantage of the hardware in there. Make some boot disks. Um, again, you know, there, is a, there is a gentleman out there that has a blog post that if you have one of the CFFA 3000s, you can actually um, boot CPM off of that. 
Um, and you can actually, there's a program out there that I've been trying to find. If anybody has it here, I'd like a copy. It's called ProPart. Um, it, it, it actually creates a ProDOS partition that you can copy CPM and actually run it from a hard disk. Um, it is out there, but every version out there is corrupt. I have not, there's one, there's, they posted it in a Google group that died about five years ago, and so nobody's actually, you know, maintaining that, but it, it, it was a program called ProPart that you need with the, um, with the PCPI card, and you can actually have it run off of a 32 meg ProDOS partition. Then you can download software, and there are tons of places, Asimov, there's tons of places to get CPM software. The interesting thing with the Apple is that if you go and you get CPM80 software from, that runs on all of the other platforms, and you can somehow get it over onto a ProDOS disk and then onto a CPM, Apple CPM disk, chances are the program is going to run because CPM80 was CPM80. Um, now, there are different versions of it out there. Obviously, CPM86, which was for the 8086, will not run on the CPM80. But you can get some of these games that were written for the Jupiter 3 that were written in CPM80. And if you can get them over onto the, C the Apple CPM formatted disk, they'll run. <laughs> And read the CPM user's guide to familiarize yourself with the commands and don't forget about PIP. <laughs> so let me go ahead and do a quick demo of some of the CPM stuff here now. And let me flip back to duplicating the screen. I promised myself this year I wouldn't get sidetracked with stories, so and I think <laughs> I think I did okay here. Um, so let's do, let's see, let's look for. I will boot there, and again, this is the this is um, Apple Win, and uh, where's the? That's it there. Okay. And when CPM boots up, this is the, the CPAM version of it from Applied Engineering version 5.1. You see the A and the bracket there. So if we do issue a DIR command, you'll see that any of the, anything that ends in a dot .com is one of the external commands that I've talked to you about or a program that, that does something on there. Now, this was the one that was designed to run on, like I said, either the Applied Engineering card for the Apple II and IIe, or the applied engineering cards for the Apple IIc. Okay, um, for the Apple IIc. So when you when you get it up and running, and you you need to load and get the rest of your hardware on there, there's a program called PC, Peripheral Configuration, <laughs> not not Personal Computer. So you run PC and basically it lists your drive names and your device names and um, A through F. So you'll see that they're all Apple Disk 2s now because that's all the emulator understands. And I'll show you this. This is where the emulator falls a little short and the hardware is a little bit better. So when I hit A to add something, you'll see that there's a RAM card and a smart port emulated in the emulator. Well, the smart port doesn't have a slot associated with it. Normally, it would have a slot 5 associated with it on the Apple IIc. So what you essentially would do here is you pick the slot number 5, and then it'll ask you to load the driver file. So the driver file for the um, Unidisc is unidsk.dvr. And you go to you know the, the disk, and it'll load that. And then essentially, it will come back here, and then you'll see B colon, you'll see the unit disk in there, and then you'll see what unit number it is in there. Then essentially what you need to do is, once you're done with that, is you basically will save it, you know, there'll be an option to save it there, and then it updates a file on the drive called um, autopc.com. And then that file runs, and that'll load when it boots up at CPM at boot time, and then that'll load all of the drivers on there. Um, show you just a few of the commands. And there's stat, for example. It says that the drive A colon is read-write and has 4K left. Um, 
that is one of the biggest things that you'll, you'll fiddle with here. If you have a three and a half inch drive or if you, you know, have a CFFA, it makes it a little bit easier. But, but basically what you need to do with the boot disk like this is, okay, what can I delete? Well, I probably don't need, um, uh, let's see, at this point, you know, sample.sub, so I can delete that and get a few back. And you'll see the blocks, the blocks are, are listed beside the file there. So, um, so, you know, again, you know, you, it get, you have to get creative to delete some of this stuff so that you can put other stuff on here to, to make it a uh, boot disk. SD is an interesting one. That'll give you um, a directory, but it'll kind of in a pretty format where, you know, it'll have lines dividing the files. Um, obviously, there's a RAM drive that you can make on here, and that's, that helps make the boot disk because if you make the RAM drive, you can pip a lot of the files up to the RAM drive, um, create a brand new disk, and then only pip the ones back that you need. Um, uh, let's see, what are some, oh, and there's submit.com, and again, you see that that's, that was one that was an external command because it's an actual com file. Okay. Um, Let's see, the other thing I just want to show real quick here is what a, uh, let's see here, why can't I get to the, I can't, let's escape out of that here, time's up, okay, time's up. <laughs> So if you guys want to see um, some of the software, the WordStar and Turbo Pascal and all that, I, I have all that available here and can show you. So any questions real quickly, I'll be here and you can stop by. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And our next speaker is Daniel. Is he here? He is in the wings. He's in the wings. Ready to come in. Okay.
for the third, I have uh, some things we think about. Uh, like, what if there were no hypothetical questions? <laughs> Short in my mind. If a deaf like person you. swears, does his mother wash his hands with soap? <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. Is there another word? Is there another word for synonym? <laughs> and what do you do if you see an endangered animal eating an endangered plant? <laughs> <laughs> I, I find one more. What's blue? It doesn't weigh very much. What's blue? It doesn't weigh very much. Light blue. Light blue. <laughs> there, uh, for the lightning talks that are coming up, there's a whiteboard upstairs. You can sign us there to uh, get on the list. Oh, no. And if a parsley farmer is sued, can they garnish his wages? <laughs> Without you, Dr. Steven. The turtle doesn't have a shell. Is it homeless or naked? <laughs> yes, screw it. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I went to the bookstore and asked the saleswoman, Where's the self help section? She said she told me it would defeat the purpose. Uh, <laughs> and what was the best thing before sliced bread? I'm sliced bread. Betty White. If one synchronized swimmer drowns, do the rest have to drown too? <laughs> <laughs> Betty White predates sliced bread. Could <laughs> be. She does. And do fish get cramps after eating? Yeah. Yeah. If you ate both pasta and anti pasta, it would oh. cancel out. <laughs> <laughs> and whose cruel idea was it for the word lisp to have an S in it? Yes. If I pay you, will you stop? <laughs> <laughs> Spilling in time. If I pay you, will you keep going? Pay <laughs> 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 <Bidding> more. Pay <laughs> more. All right, I'm. I think I'm. You know, I'm not ready, but I'm ready. He's he's tired of the joke, so. Oh yeah. So, as you can see, I got tons of stuff, and I'm the only one who can see it right now. Um, so, let's see. I don't have slides, but. so far. Um, there's a lot of stuff that works. 
Um, not everything works. Um, I guess I'll point things out and we'll let people have some illustrations maybe. And uh, just like things I learned along the way. Um, yeah. So I guess hardware, everybody likes hardware. There's a lot of it here. And um, so um, I guess my strategy here is I have, there's a lot of peripherals in the 2GS. Um, to make a board that replicates everything is a lot of work. So my strategy is to start with a run-of-the-mill like a development board and um, add on a, a dartboard per peripheral and get that working. And uh, just keep continuing until I have a 2GS, right? It's that easy. Um, uh, I am getting into a kind of sticky point that like I'm running out of pins on my dev board, so eventually I will have to consolidate some of this. But uh, every time I think I'm going to have to go ahead and make the final like large PCB, I find another thing I can um, hang off the connector that's right there. So um, I'm going to show you what's here. And these are really dusty because some of these are old, some of them are new, um, and auto focuses. So we're going to get this one. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm doing breaking my rule. I'm like, Moving the camera around, you guys are getting vertigo. Okay, so what do we have here? Um, here's the FPGA the board itself. This is like a Cyclone 4 series from Altera. It is, uh, you don't need anything special for 2GS. There's not that much hardware in it. Um, you, need, you don't need that many gates. Um, one thing I found that made it easier is to get a chip with a lot of RAM, um, like chip RAM built in. And, the reason for that is there's three memory buses in the 2GS. There's the main fast memory, there's the uh, Mega 2 memory, and the sound memory. And um, they all have separate buses. And rather than try and work on like how, how I'm going to multiply those together, um, I realized that two of the buses connect to very small amounts of memory. I just put those on the FPGA internally. Coincidentally, that, that's the fastest memory available to me. I'm using it for the, the slowest the thing that has to run the slowest, but it's the most convenient. I'll have to change that later, you know, to use external RAM or I don't know. Um, so, that's this board here. Um, this huge thing is the sound chip, just a normal um, eight channel uh, audio DAC. It's not a huge board because I didn't want to lay out a board and it's quicker to buy one. It's more, it's a lot more expensive, but it's quicker. Um, so this is an analog devices uh, DAC. The 2GS, it has a, um, a separate micro. When they added ADB, um, there's this complicated protocol that connects to the peripherals. <coughs> But they still wanted the normal, hey, there's a, a key press in this register uh, functionality to work. So there's a whole another microcontroller that does that. Um, and my version is the same, although I'm not using the same uh, chip. I just have the STM32, this is like a discovery board, which I don't know why the connector's on the bottom, but that's what they do. So everything's upside down. So the important part, I guess, is the top with all these wires. Um, and that handles the keyboard and mouse. I've actually combined the clock chip and the battery RAM into it because um, this STM32 has a built-in real-time clock. So those are kind of combined into one feature on the real hardware. There's a separate chip uh, for the RTC. Um, the clock works in my version, um, but the, I don't have a battery in my hardware, so like when you turn it off, it'll uh, forget what time it is, but it, it will work when I have the hardware. Uh, what else do we have here? RGB board here. I didn't color code it, the wires. RGB is that nice. Um, it, my strategy starting with this project is to, um, it's a 2GS. 
I want to make everything that works on the 2GS work on this hardware. Um, 2GS has our GP monitor. That's where I want to work. Um, I know there are a lot of opportunities to use uh, in like requests to use newer uh, display uh, types. And I think that's something I want to do, but like when you do that, when you change any of the peripherals, especially video, um, because of the way that the circuitry scans each line, like you have to sometimes make a philosophical decision of what part you want to not work the same way anymore. And uh, I'm not ready to make that decision, so um, RGB for now. Um, this drive, this is like the most recent one that I got working. Um, so here we got the disk drive and the daughter card. Let's see here. Oh, too close. For the fabled um, 19 pin connector that uh, nobody can find. Well, actually, you can find this one because everybody wants the thing that plugs into this one. They don't want the, the female version, they want the one on the cable of the drive that you plug in. So you can still get these. Except you can't get a like a through hole like a right angle connector. You've got to have this little adapter, the solder bottom. Oh, this is just the uh, power. This should be power. And then the dev board for the SDN32 only has one USB board, so this is like a little tiny thing to give it extra USB. Wow, that's a lot. Okay. Um, Let's see if it does anything. I'm not sure, like, I don't know, like, do I should I point the monitor at the audience? But then I want to put the camera. Um, yeah, that would help. Or I can, like, maybe just set it, like, because now I'm not going to show and tell hardware mode. So I might be able to just point it at the monitor. There's a bunch of OSHA violations going on here. <laughs> I know. The chairs don't have five legs, right? Negative. Negative cameraman. Yeah, what, what else can we get you? Oh. And I also want to thank the KFS committee for accepting my talk. I literally told them only what is in the, the program, <laughs> which is almost nothing. So. Um, in particular, I didn't tell them I had a lot of stuff to set up. So I'll just write it on the I'm going to do it this way. Let's see if it works. Okay, so um, nothing is actually running on the laptop, but I do. The FPG A is in a mode right now where, uh, or the board's configured where um, it's loading its configuration from the JTAG ports, so I do have to like start my computer to, uh, just to flash.
juncture. Um, the RAM or the ROM in the 2GS is right up on the, the main CPU bus and directly accessible. Um, today, like ROM is not really, I don't know, able to do that. So I, I have a serial ROM with the ROM image and I load that at startup into RAM. So what happens is there's a very small program in like a pseudo ROM in the FPGA bitstream that uh, is actually a 65816 code that will uh, read from the spy port to load the ROM contents into RAM. And so after that, um, the top section of uh, RAM is marked as read only, so it looks like ROM, and then uh, we never contact that memory again. Um, and I don't know if you noticed too, like there was the address in the corner, it started at bank F0. Um, the firmware starts at FC, I think, um, but you have you can put ROM, uh, ROM disk or uh, ROM tools as low as F0. So um, I was playing with those at one time. It's actually I should have thought a little bit more. This is not a good thing. All right, so. Alright, so where's my keyboard? One thing I did change from the original GS so far was I'm using the USB first. I do want to get ADB working originally, but they were so similar, like user, user experience wise, that um, I don't know, I was prepared to make that decision. Um, so let's see. Okay, so we got a control panel. Um, just, I don't know, maybe I'll talk about bringing that up. One of the caveats is like not all the hardware is implemented, so I had to make new defaults for the ROM. Um, usually not everything gets a check mark when it's set to your card. Um, for me it is, and also it's brown because that way I know that my new settings were taking effect. Um, so I'm going to enable the two slots that actually have some something working. Uh, I guess what else can we do? Maybe show off video modes. Sound. Oh, I Sound. Anyway, let's see. Okay. Let's see. Does anybody ever do this on this? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, I would play with it, but I would put it back to the channel. Okay. All right. We're good. That's the reason. See? I did it all the time. Um, okay, so now, let's see. Oh, I got this one, too. Oh, I got this one. We'll do this first. Um, I was going to demonstrate the five and a quarter first, but um, let's go right for super high res, I guess. Um, don't have the borders yet because it's handy to um, see what's happening, like where we're scanning um, or what does. A little fuzzy here on the camera. Um, but yeah, so I, I guess. In the course of this project, it's been, it was a while before I got anything working. So I got the CPU going, I got, I was able to code that up, but nothing, you can't really test anything until you have software. Um, you can't run a lot of software until I have peripherals. So I um, uh, started with the CPU, tried to get video modes working, because then you can just load a, a RAM dump of video memory and see what happens. Um, got sound working, got the keyboard and, and uh, actually just keyboard at first, um, concentrating on the 8-bit video modes. And then um, once I finally got the disk drive port working, then I can now, that's kind of where I am now, I can load stuff and see what is wrong. So a lot of stuff works, reboot. Um, the mouse is the most <coughs> recent thing that works. 
Yeah, I have two drives. Well, this one's KTS 14. Thank you for that giveaway. It's <laughs> <laughs> running normal GS speed. And oh, right. So what's the speed? Versus regular. Yeah, um, this is regular speed. So yeah, so you have the opportunity to make like built-in built -in acceleration. Um, and that's definitely possible. I haven't done that yet. Um, the CPU, I say, does run faster. The bottleneck I have right now is, so I'm using DDR2 memory. And so in the Apple II GS, we have just normal, um, was it, uh, I don't know, like, yes, uh, it's not static RAM, but like dynamic RAM, but it's not clocked. Um, we put an address on the pins in a certain sequence with a certain timing, and this many nanoseconds later, you get your answer. And the way that's implemented in the Apple II is um, that all fits in a normal clock cycle. Um, modern memory doesn't work that way. You have, you tell the memory, I would like this memory when you're able to, and then you have to wait a lot of cycles for it to appear. That's called latency. And there's different, um, that's all those numbers like 2 3 2 when you, um, when you buy RAM for your uh, desktop computer. And, um, you get the bytes a lot later when you ask for them, but once that stream is opened up, like the bytes come flowing out very quickly. Um, so um, the if you are able to keep that cycle going, you can get the memory. You know, you can uh, access memory very quickly. Uh, but in the case of the Apple II, you don't know exactly what memory you want, so you're asking for a byte at a time. So basically. The way it's implemented now, you go through the whole latency cycle every every, every, byte. every byte. Yeah. So there's a there's a very obvious optimization for caching because you get like 16 or four. Or you get more than one byte back every time. And um, if you ask for bytes, you know, 4,000, 4,001. Right now in my implementation, it it asks the memory twice and waits for that. So it's kind of weird, like. I do have the FBI implemented, and it does go to fast mode, and the CPU executes as fast as possible. But the memory slows it down, and it's kind of about the same speed as an ROGS. So it just worked out that way. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I'm finding now, like as I'm starting to write more software, or like trying to run more software, that um, like some of the things that aren't working may be related to like the clock speed. Like maybe like especially sound, like if something has sound and then interrupt happening at a periodic rate, um, I think that may be taking more cycles, um, and then there's not as many cycles available for the, the main part of the code running in the normal context. So that might be something I look at soon. Um, but yeah, so, so what's a theoretical in this particular chip? Um, CPU, I think it runs at like 40 megahertz right now. With the simple optimization, I'm not simple, but like the, there's something I'm thinking of doing that I could probably double that. Um, that's what I would do first. Um, I can tell you about that, and then um, then it's just little odds and ends. How can you speed it up a little bit at a time? But that would be the big one. So 80 megahertz. Um, but um, it's a real GS, right? I want to make it work like a real GS, so I have a real one megahertz bus. Um, so a lot of things will still behave slowly because you're accessing them the way they, you know, they should be the cycle accurate way. So um, I can envision a mode that, um, you know, like a, a control panel that you can turn off that mode or something so that if you don't care. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you don't have the, the one negative uh, bottleneck for that. Because everything internal can run at the, the faster rate. Um, it's just for compatibility with anything external. Um, and I don't even have slots yet, so that was the big thing I needed to make the separate board for. Um, did that answer the question? Kind of. Sort of, kind of. Okay, cool. Um, um, 
I may have like requests for people with certain expertise. So we loaded the second disc of Hyper Studio and the mouse still works, but the pointer isn't being redrawn. And I think that has to do with interrupts. Like it's not, it's just not getting drawn correctly. So I don't know if we're gonna start a new stack right now. We can start a new stack, but we can't put it in the hand. You have questions? The drawing of the cursor is done by the blank. So if the vertical blank is working properly, then the cursor will draw properly. Okay, it's drawn on the V blank? I, yeah, it's the, the V blank. Okay, so I do implement the V blank and then the, also the, is it the almost a quarter second interrupt? Um, but obviously it's working at some point and it's, it fails to work. So maybe like the enabling of that interrupt or something like that, it's, it's not getting restarted. It's not getting cleared up. Yeah, something like that. Okay, I can look through that. Um, okay. There is two GS though. I also wanted to show some eight bit stuff. Because the two GS can also do eight bit stuff. Um, and it does it in a slightly different way than the real. Like a, I said, we don't like that Apple II uh, Plus or two e does. Question. Yes. What exactly are you doing for the CPU? Is that emulated, or you have a real one that you're running fast, or what? Oh, it is a, um, it's emulated, so the CPU is written in the same way, you know, in the, the HDL. So it's part of the FPGA bitstream. Um, and that was like the first part I did. <coughs> okay, so you, you you wrote the CPU emulator for the for the right. So we have like the, the psycho accurate six five eight sixteen core and barrel of the town. Arbitrary things that I had lying around. Um, <coughs> to test out various video modes. Yep. You called it. Played a little too much. Yeah, like this one. So we're gonna take this sound. But um, I guess so. One thing I will point out. So the the one bit sound is working. Um, I don't know if it's an example, but like I guess you can notice like the fringes that would be you have the NTSC artifacts on the 8-bit um, Apple IIs, and then when Apple made the video controller in the 2GS, they wanted to fix it. And I, if I did air quotes, I would do air quotes now, but I don't do air quotes, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> But fix so. Having it both ways though, it's kind of like. But um, so they tried to fix our some certain artifacts, and um, they introduced others. So anyways, um, uh, Jeff is it Jeff Body or Body? I don't know if you're familiar with Jeff Body. He uh, he found the patent that for Apple II circuit that does this NTSC coding. So um, that's implemented in here. Um, one of the things I, I designed the hardware for but haven't implemented yet is uh, like while I do like this and I want this to work too, like I also really like the way that uh, the APIC modes work on a uh, composite CRT, so I want to include that output as well. And I wasn't going to include the two GSs or, or composite from, uh, from the RGB until Dave Schmidt did his session in the last year, and now I have to. <laughs> um, so maybe that will come around uh, eventually. 
Okay. We've got five minutes. Okay. Here's another arbitrary. I know there are a lot of uh, disk 2 and IWM people here. Um, that's the new feature that I've implemented. I might have some questions on that. Um, I'm able to read up most disks, but it's still kind of temperamental and, um, in this case, a little slow. Like it's seeking for a sector, not finding it on the first pass. Um, the part I'm not sure, like there's also the patent for the IWM and like there's the there's a specific spot where it tells you how when the high bit is set in the middle song. Oh here we go. It freezes the data register and the particular mechanism uses to stop that. And I did record in the patent and it didn't work. Or at least I thought it did, to my knowledge. So either I'm wrong with my implementation or the patent. A real sneaky trick. That, that part is also described in beneath Apple ProDOS, the logic state sequencer. Yep. Okay, but that the IWM though? That's just well, a that's the same, same thing. No, that's the same. Yeah. That's the same. <laughs> I mean, I guess I could implement the disk 2 one and then that might work. But yeah, because you have the asynchronous modes too in IWM and then um, you have this extra hardware to support the asynchronous mode, but um, it still has to be useful for the synchronous uh, mode. So we were fortunate. I chose this one because it has double high res and, uh, and it has the wheel. And it with lots of colors um, continuously, like the barrier between the colors is changing on different pixel boundaries. So I see that. <coughs> And then um, I'll spin the wheel, that'll be good for that. And then I have one more disk to boot up and, uh, and show that it has a lot of stuff that doesn't work. So that part works this way. Yeah, <laughs> this way. See, this is the part where I think it's faster on the real hardware. And uh, um, if I change the delay that the body's being held in the register to make it longer, some other things begin to work and some other things begin to not work. So, um, it's too many. But yeah, we got the, the 2GS style, I guess, double high res uh, pixel boundary. But So that's implemented. I'm actually like an audio, like a music hobbyist as well. So um, that was a fun part. Um, but it's one of those things where I um, it's implemented and most of it's there. But now I have to run it with real software um, to find what doesn't work. And that was a wonderful segue. I didn't. What stuff? What stuff do you know of? What stuff are like the, the, the things that aren't done? Big things that aren't done? Well, the, the slot interface is a big thing that's not done yet. Um, the serial ports are not done, but you can actually still buy the chips, the Zilog chips for the serial port. It's like three generations or two generations newer than the ones that are in the 2GS, but supposedly uh, compatible. Um, so that's, they're not done. Those are probably the main things. I'm sure as soon as I think about something else, I remember. Yeah. Uh, do you support any type of acceleration? And what other features does this uh, have you implemented or looking at implementing that uh, expands over our real CGS? Acceleration. So yes, um, and it's it's. I'm not even sure you want to call it acceleration, but I will. Um, the, the reason is because in the 2GS you have the 2.8 megahertz, you have fast cycle and slow cycle, um, and that's all you get. 
And so you have to tack on extra hardware to have this you know, third layer now running at a faster speed and then talking to the rest of the system. Because I'm re-implementing the, the base hardware, that 2.8 me megahertz now can be you know, 40. So it's kind of like built in. Um, if I fix some other bottlenecks, the fast cycles just become faster. But they work the same way that they work on the, um, the real 2GS hardware. And like new features, I really haven't thought about that too much. I want to keep my focus. Um, uh, Accurate first. Yeah, I want to see. I want to get what works on the 2GS working first. I mean, there's tons of stuff you can think about. Um, I was. That's one reason I didn't get to give this talk in you know the past because I'm worried about people telling me, oh, how come it doesn't have this or that? To tell you the truth, so um, that always comes up on CSA too. Um, <coughs> I don't want to go on a rant, right? Somebody spends a lot of time working on this implementation, you know, for whatever, six or 12 months, and somebody says, well, why doesn't it do it this way? It's like, because they did it. <laughs> yeah, so, um, <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> and this weird thing is probably the thing I'm thinking about is totally different than what you're thinking about, but it happens, so, um, I don't know why I said that, but um, yeah, I was kind of concerned about that, but um, I'm, I can handle it now, I think. Um, what do I want to add? Obviously, um, anything mechanical that's going to be breaking down, we have, like the video. Um, one thing I already, or you know, this monitor, I mean, I got an extra one in the garage anyway, because they're going to not work. Um, um, so, like mass storage, I would like to add. So maybe things that are on a um, Mark Twain, you know, the scuffed card of Mark Twain, um, that's a reasonable thing. But like maybe like CFFA 2 level, where it's mass storage, it's, you again have this philosophical debate, like do you want to put a floppy drive emulator on this if it's really a 2, an Apple 2GS? Um, maybe you do. Um, but then again, you can stick a CFFA 3000 in it. Um, or you will be able to. So um, I, I want to add like base level improvements that people for things that people had, you know, pretty much across the board. Like everybody had it after a certain point. I guess in the TGS lifetime, um, all the people that still used it had a hard drive. Um, things like that, and also like the peripherals that already have USB um, keyboard and mice supported. Um, oh right. We gotta be done. Yep. So somebody asked about the Insonic. I will boot up something. Oh, I, did I change this guy? I'm sorry. So this is uh, FTA. So modulate. You can hear the sound repeating because there's a flag in that each channel in the Sonic that tells you if you want to play once or loop. And so there's something not right with that. Um, and then we can load. Um, oh, 320 or not 320. So we get sound. Um, but this is where this one ends. It's forever decrunching. So um, we do have sound. That's kind of all we have now, I guess. So, can, can, you, the question? can you trigger the, uh, uh, the Easter egg in the Route 3 for the, uh, where everyone shows up to you go uh, control and? It does work. In fact, I used that a lot with when I was testing. Um, the sound hardware? I actually don't remember. If you're <laughs> Just real quick, it is 12. It's time to go to lunch. If you want to stick around and continue to watch this, you certainly can. Uh, the next session after this will start at 1.15. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. No, you know, not a cow. I was. Yeah, I mean.
Yes, is it this afternoon, right? Yes, yes. okay. Yeah, so I just, like, then after we're trying to probably talk, we're like, doing like, similar, right similar diving in the heart. Cool, thank you. He's got a lot of timing data. I know it's very relevant. Like, on the. Yeah, Yes, you have the Mega 2 doing some video modes. It outputs a little um, 
zero to 15 value, you know, to the BGC, which then incorporates it into the rest of the system. Um, I kind of incorporated all the video stuff together. Right. Just make the distinction between like the Mega 2 and the BGC in terms of video.